Good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon. There's a good start. Good evening. It's probably afternoon where some of you are. How's your Friday going? Hope you've had a good day. Getting a late start here again. It seems to be kind of the normal. I'm not sure if this is late or if this is just the new normal. Between the normal work day and then transition time and just taking care of daily business, this seems to be the usual time. So maybe I'll just give in and say this is it. This is normal. So Folklore Friday today, which I've been looking forward to. Right now we're reading through a little book called Irish Fairy and Folk Tales. Good place to start. It has a lot of themes that have, uh, I don't know, personally I find them interesting. They've also been a pretty big influence on my work in progress. So a lot of these have elements you've probably heard in a lot of other stories. It's just kind of how folklore works, but it's kind of fun to explore those and go through and they're very, they're told very differently than modern stories. They don't follow, they don't very often follow the hero's journey. They don't follow sort of standard three act structures. They're here and they're strange and they're gone. And that's one of the things I like about them. So all the photos for what it's worth that are playing in the background there can be found on the site unsplash.com. I'm not really intending to advertise it, but these are all free photos licensed for sharing this way and other uses, even commercial use. It's a really great site if you're looking for this sort of thing. And I encourage you to go there and look up some things and uh, support the artists who contribute their work there, keep the site going. If you're looking for some photo work, maybe even find someone to hire. Again, not officially sponsored by them. I just like their site a lot. All right. Well, that is a good musical theme starting up there to do this. So why don't we go ahead? Let me hop out just for a sec. I'm trying to train Pretzel Rocks play stuff that I actually like. Let's, uh, there we go. Start building up a list of songs that worked well for the folklore section. Although I guess by the time I get to folklore from other countries, I'll have to find some other music for them too. So I'm going to read two, maybe three different stories tonight, and then I'll be moving on to writing sprints because honestly, this is turning into my most productive writing time is when I hold myself accountable to write in front of an audience for some reason. So, hey, if it works, go with it. We, I had probably the best stream I've ever had the other night too. Thank you to everyone who was there. Um, everyone who showed up and was asking questions and offering up information about the stories that they're working on. Blue Banana in particular. It's been a regular on the stream in the past and has been a real help. Asked great questions. It's a great conversationalist. So thank you again for your help. It's much appreciated. Well, before the music is gone, why don't we go ahead and start in. The first story is called The Lady... Of Dolores. Again, I'll have to warn you, uh, there are a lot of words in these stories that I have no idea how to pronounce, and there's no good pronunciation guide on these. In fact, if you, I did some research before the stream tonight, looking up, looking for some help, honestly, and found none. Uh, in fact, every reference to some of the words that are in here, I found, um, seemed just as perplexed as I am. So basically, I think it's safe to make up a pronunciation. Okay, we've moved on to a different song, and I do not like the sound of this one. Eh, we'll leave it. We'll leave it. It's not so bad. 
All right, maybe. <laughs> the Lady of Dolores, as told by T. Crofton Croker. On the shore of Smurwit Harbor, one fine summer's morning, just at daybreak, stood Dick Fitzgerald, shocking the Dedeen, which may be translated, smoking his pipe. The sun was gradually rising behind the lofty Brandon. The dark sea was getting green in the light, and the mist clearing away out of the valleys went rolling and curling like the smoke from the corner of Dick's mouth. "'Tis just the pattern of a pretty morning,' said Dick, taking the pipe from between from between his lips and looking towards the distant ocean, which lay as still and tranquil as a tomb of polished marble. Well, to be sure, he continued he, after a pause, tis mighty lonesome to be talking to oneself by way of company, and not to have another soul to answer one, nothing but the child of one's own voice, the echo. I know this, that if I had the luck, or maybe the misfortune, said Dick, with a melancholy smile, to have the woman... It would not be this way with me. And what in the wide world is a man without a wife? He's no more surely than a bottle without a drop of drink in it, or dancing without music, or the left leg of a scissors, or a fishing line without a hook, or any other matter that is no ways complete. Is it not so, said Dick Fitzgerald, casting his eyes toward a rock upon the strand, which, though it could not speak, stood up as firm and looked as bold as ever Terry Witness did. But what was his astonishment at beholding, just at the foot of that rock, a beautiful young creature combing her hair, which was a sea-green color. And now the salt water shining upon it appeared in the morning light like melted butter upon cabbage. Dick guessed at once that she was a marrow, although he had never seen one before, for he spied the Colleen Druith a little enchanted cap which the sea people use for diving down into the ocean, lying upon the strand near her. And he had heard that if once he could possess himself of the cap, she would lose the power of going away into the water. So he seized it with all speed, and she, hearing the noise, turned her head about as natural as any Christian. When the marrow saw that her little diving cap was gone, the salt tears, doubly salt no doubt, from her, came trickling down her cheeks, and she began a low, mournful cry with just the tender voice of a newborn infant. Dick, although he knew well enough what she was crying for, determined to keep the Colleen Druith, let her cry never so much to see what luck would come out of it. Yet he could not help pitying her, and when the dumb thing looked up in his face, and her cheeks all moist with tears, t'was enough to make anyone feel, let alone Dick, who had ever and always, like most of his countrymen, a mighty tender heart of his own. Don't cry, my darling, said Dick Fitzgerald. But the marrow, like any bold child, only cried the more for that. Dick sat himself down by her side and took hold of her hand by way of comforting her. It was in no particular an ugly hand, only there was a small web between the fingers, as there is in a duck's foot. But twas as thin and as white as the skin between egg and shell. "'What's your name, my darling?' says Dick, thinking to make her conversant with him. But he got no answer, and he was certain sure now either that she could not speak or did not understand him. He therefore squeezed her hand in his as the only way he had of talking to her. "'It's the universal language, and there's not a woman in the world, be she fish or lady, that does not understand it.'" The marrow did not seem much displeased at this mode of conversation and making an end of her whining all at once. Man, says she, looking up in Dick Fitzgerald's face, man, will you eat me? By all the red petticoats and check aprons between Dingle and Traley, cried Dick, jumping up in amazement. I'd as soon eat myself, my jewel. Is it I eat you, my pet? Now, twas some ugly, ill-looking thief of a fish that put that notion into your own pretty head, with a nice green hair down upon it, that is so cleanly combed out this morning. Man, said the marrow, what will you do with me if you won't eat me? Dick's thoughts were running on a wife. He saw at the first glimpse that she was handsome, but since she spoke and spoke too like any real woman, he was fairly in love with her. Twas the neat way she called him man that settled the matter entirely. Fish, says Dick, trying to speak to her after her own short fashion. 
Fish, says he, here is my word, fresh and fasting, for you this blessed morning that I'll make you Mistress Fitzgerald before all the world, and that's what I'll do. Never say the word twice, says she. I'm ready and willing to be yours, Mr. Fitzgerald. But stop, if you please, till I twist up my hair. It was some time before she had settled it entirely to her liking. For she guessed, I suppose, that she was going among strangers where she would be looked at. When that was done, the marrow put the comb in her pocket and then bent down her head and whispered some words to the water that was close to the foot of the rock. Dick saw the murmur of the words upon the top of the sea, going out towards the wide ocean, just like a breath of wind rippling along. And, says he in the greatest wonder, Is it speaking you are, my darling, to the salt water? It's nothing else, says she, quite carelessly. I'm just sending word home to my father, not to be waiting breakfast for me, just to keep him from being uneasy in his mind. And who's your father, my duck, says Dick. What, said the marrow, did you never hear of my father? He's the king of the waves, to be sure. And yourself, then, is a real king's daughter, said Dick, opening his two eyes to take a full and true survey of his wife that was to be. Oh, I'm nothing else but a made man with you, and a king your father. To be sure, he has all the money that's down in the bottom of the sea. Money, repeated the marrow. What's money? "'Tis no bad thing to have when one wants it,' replied Dick. "'And maybe now the fishes have the understanding to bring up whatever you bid them?' "'Oh, yes,' said the marrow. "'They bring me what I want.' "'To speak the truth, then,' said Dick, "'tis a straw bed I have at home before you, "'and that, I'm thinking, is no ways fitting for a king's daughter. "'So it would not be displeasing to you "'just to mention a nice feather bed with a pair of, pair of new blankets.' But what am I talking about? Maybe you have not such things as beds down under the water. By all means, said she. Mr. Fitzgerald, plenty of beds at your service. I have fourteen oyster beds of my own, not to mention one just planting for the rearing of young ones. You have, says Dick, scratching his head and looking a little puzzled. Tis a feather bed I was speaking of, but... Clearly, yours is very cut of a decent plan to have bed and supper so handy to each other that a person, when they'd have the one, would never need ask the other. However, bed or no bed, money or no money, Dick Fitzgerald determined to marry the marrow and the marrow to have given her consent. Away they went, therefore, across the strand, from Gollerus to Ballinrunig, where Father Fitzgibbon happened to be that morning. There are two words to this bargain, Dick Fitzgerald, said his reverence, looking mighty glum. And is it a fishy woman you'd marry? The Lord preserve us, send the scaly creature home to her own people. That's my advice to you, wherever she came from. Dick had the tolu and druith in his hand, and was about to give it back to the marrow, who looked covetously at it. But he thought for a moment, and then says he, Please, your reverence, reverence, she's a king's daughter. If she was the daughter of fifty kings, said Father Fitzgibbon, I tell you, you can't marry her, she being a fish. Please, your reverence, said Dick again, in an undertone. She is as mild and as beautiful as the moon. If she was as mild and as beautiful as the sun, moon, and stars all put together, I tell you, Dick Fitzgerald, said the priest, stamping his right foot, you can't marry her, she being a fish. But she has all the gold that's down in the sea, only for the asking, and I'm a made man if I marry her. And, said Dick, looking up slyly, I can make it worth anyone's while to do the job. Oh, that alters the case entirely, replied the priest. Why, there's some reason now on what you say. Why didn't you tell me this before? Marry her, by all means, if she was ten times a fish. Money, you know, is not to be refused in these bad times. And I may as well have the hands to live it as another that maybe would not take half the pains in counseling you that I have done. So Father Fitzgibbon married Dick Fitzgerald to the marrow, and like any loving couple, they returned to Dolores well pleased with each other. Everything prospered with Dick. He was at the sunny side of the world. The marrow made the best of wives, and they lived together in the greatest contentment. It was wonderful to see, considering 
where she had been brought up, how she would busy herself about the house, and how well she nursed the children. For the end of three years, there were as many young Fitzgeralds, two boys and a girl. In short, Dick was a happy man, so he might have continued to the end of his days if only he had got the sense to take proper care of what he had got. Many another man, however, beside Dick, has not had wit enough to do that. One day when Dick was obliged to go to Tralee, Tralee, he left the wife minding the children at home after him, and thinking she had plenty to do without disturbing his fishing tackle. Dick was no sooner gone than Mrs. Fitzgerald set about cleaning up the house, and chancing to pull down a fishing net, what should she find behind it in a hole in the wall but her own Toleen Druith? She took it out and looked at it, and then she thought of her father the king, and her mother the queen, and her brothers and sisters, and she felt a longing to go back to them. Pardon me for a moment. Not that either. I guess we'll try this. She sat down on a little stool and thought over the happy days she had spent under the sea. Then she looked at her children and thought on the love and affection of poor Dick and how it would break his heart to lose her. But, says she, he won't lose me entirely, for I'll come back to him again. And who can blame me for going to see my father and my mother after being so long away from them? She got up and went towards the door, but came back again to look once more at the child that, she, that was sleeping in the cradle. She kissed it gently, and as she kissed it, a tear trembled for an instant in her eye, and then fell on its rosy cheek. She wiped away the tear, and turning to the eldest little girl, told her to take good care of her brothers, and to be a good child herself, until she came back. The marrow then went down to the strand. The sea was lying calm and smooth, just heaving and glittering in the sun, and she thought she heard a faint sweet singing inviting her to come down. All her old ideas and feelings came flooding over her mind. Dick and her children were at the instant forgotten. And placing the totally Druith on her head, she plunged in. Dick came home in the evening, and missing his wife, he asked Catalan, his little girl, what had become of her mother. But she did not tell him. He then inquired of the neighbors, and he learned that she was seen going toward the strand with a strange-looking thing, like a cocked hat in her hand. He returned to his cabin to search for the totally Druith. It was gone and the truth now flashed upon him. Year after year did Dick Fitzgerald wait expecting the return of his wife, but he never saw her more. Dick never married again, always thinking that the marrow would sooner or later return to him, and nothing could ever persuade him but that her father the king kept her below by main force. For, said Dick, she surely would not have herself given up her husband and her children. While she was with him, she was so good a wife in every respect that to this day she is spoken of in the tradition of the country as the pattern for one under the name of the Lady of Dollars. And that is that story. Um, definitely some elements of this that, you know, don't really, uh, that, that, that definitely sound antiquated and acronistic. I mean, all of these stories are going to have some element of that. But this guy's attitude is he basically abducts Oh, hey, thanks very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, yeah, this thing, this guy who's basically kidnapping this woman and acts like he's treating her, you know, like a princess. Um, <laughs> What's your name, my darling, says Dick, thinking to make her conversant with him. But he got no answer and he was certain now she couldn't talk. It's like, maybe she doesn't trust you, pal. And then this thing of uh, she did not understand him. He therefore squeezed her hand in his as the only way he had of talking to her. It's the universal language and there's not a woman in the world, be she fish or lady, that does not understand it. Obviously, um, there's some kind of silliness in that, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's hard to tell. 
You know, these days, if someone wrote something like this, they would kind of be making fun of the guy. I think they are a little bit here. But it's easy to read it as this guy who's obviously just, just absolutely clueless, right? A, a true love story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, kind of of the old school, but there you go. Um, for a variation on this story, highly recommended that you go watch a film called Song of the Sea. It is an animated film. It's going to look, if you just see the still shots, like it's just something for little kids, but it isn't. It's actually, it's kind of an all ages movie. Certainly suitable for kids, but um, there's a lot in the story that goes that kids aren't going to pick up on that an adult will really enjoy. And it is gorgeous. It is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, really good story. Beautifully told. Really good music. And uh, yeah. But anyway, it also, it starts out, uh, the very first scenes are, uh, she's not a marrow, as described here. She is a selkie. And it's not really described that she is that. You just kind of, you get the idea from what the film's about in general and from some of the first imagery in the film that, um, so selkie is kind of like a woman who transforms into a seal in the water. Um, when she comes out, she takes off her seal coat and becomes human. And similarly, uh, there's this idea that if someone takes her coat, her seal coat, she can't return to the water. And so um, this seems to be what's going on in the film. But there's a lot more to the story. And the story actually focuses more on her kids and a little journey that they go on. And um, again, beautiful, beautiful story. And told a little bit more as a more bona fide love story than something like this. So a couple words in here that I had not seen before. Marrow, even M-E-R-R-O-W. Do not seal a lady's coat, especially if she is a magic seal lady. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that in this telling, she it doesn't seem like she minds so much as it is that... Um, like she she leaves of her own will early on in the film. But anyway, go see it. Go go watch it sometime if you haven't seen it. Really, really good movie. Hey Nikki, how are you doing? We're just between stories here. Uh so one of the other words in this that I had never seen and one of the it was one of the ones I tried to look up that referred to her hat. Um, and that was the, let me find it here, the Kohulin Druith, which doesn't really, like, match to any particular, when I looked up um, Irish Gaelic pronunciation, it doesn't really follow the same phonetic system. So it's kind of like a, um, it's C-O-H-U, here I'll type it out in chat. But it doesn't seem to follow the same kind of spelling or phonetic rules that the Gaelic does. So I, I presume that it's actually been adapted into a more uh, like like an English spelling to try to capture the pronunciation. But apparently it's a hat that the Marrow wears uh, similar to the Selkie's coat that allows her to go home again. Um, and the other one, right at the very beginning, is that he's shocking, shog, shogging, uh -huh. shuffing, maybe? Shuffing could even be. S-H-O-G-H-I-N-G. Shuffing the dudine, which may be translated, smoking his pipe. So there you go. Tired. Me too. Let me tell you, boy, last two days, I, I've got to work over the weekend just because I was so absolutely f just floored with fatigue that I didn't wasn't able to put in full days. It's the other reason I'm starting late tonight. You had an ex interesting experience on Dead Frontier. OK, do tell. We'll take a little pause here between the stories.
Yeah, yesterday between... So part of it was um, Wednesday stream went really late. I streamed to like 3 in the morning here, which is a lot of fun, honestly. And I knew I'd be tired the next day, but I wasn't just tired. I wasn't just like, oh boy, boy, I didn't get enough sleep. Can't be hard to concentrate. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't keep my eyes open. That carried through yesterday. Yesterday night, I had a big errand to do. And then got to bed at a semi-decent time. And then just today was just a mess again. With the event ending... Oh, you had an interesting experience. Okay, with the event ending, you no longer needed... Oh, the items that you made that you talked about the other night. Yeah. So you sold them to someone and made some equipment for your friend. Cool. What did you make? But anyway, yeah, I just ended up sleeping. I, I basically got enough done. I got to a stopping point, did the daily stuff I got to do, and then just absolutely crashed. Slept straight through the time I originally wanted to start streaming. But I feel okay now. Going into nocturnal mode. I think, honestly, I think, I don't know about you, I think my body is ready for summer to be done. I am just waiting for fall to come and then late nights, late, dark, rainy nights. Yes, please. Let's see, I just picked up a book you've been working on again. You're a little plot blocked, but you're very happy about it. Oh, very cool. Uh, so let's see, the items were a sniper, an SMG, and a sword for yourself. Okay. SMG, is that short machine gun? I'm really bad at acronyms, like not just gaming acronyms, but even common ones like I'm working with someone to help sell a car. Enough of that story, except that <clears throat> the guy whose services I'm, submachine gun, thank you. Um, the guy whose services I've enlisted is like, oh yeah, blah, 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 and we'll list it on CL, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, CL, what's CL? CL? I'm like, duh, Craigslist, hello. The items he sold to go for 40 million. Ooh. I parted with them for 25 million since you felt the guy would use them. Well, that's nice. So what's a typical sort of a price for something in that game? Like I remember I used to play uh, DC Universe Online and I never did the monthly subscription because it was just, you know, especially at that time I was like, a oh, monthly subscription for a game? No way. Um, but anyway, I ended up like doing, they had a couple like bonus weekend, you know, like, like, game, they'll, like they'll do with a lot of games. And it allowed me into the market. I'm like, oh, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and sell this thing. And I, I didn't know what to list it at. And I put it at like 750,000, whatever the you know units are in that game. And it sold like almost instantly. I'm like, what? Holy cow. You mean I probably could have sold that for more and just waited a little bit? Anyway, it was really interesting. Yeah, you go into that market. You can sell things for such inflated prices and... Compared to the people who just played the free game, like suddenly you can buy this, that, and everything. It's like, I'm instantly rich. And say, so, yep, he needed them, and you'd feel bad price gouging when you had no intent on flipping them. Well, I, no, I like that. I like that approach. Not everyone appreciates that, but I like that. It's actually like... <laughs> Again, in the, this car that we have to sell, it's not ours. We're, we're selling it on behalf of my dad. Um, nice car, by the way. If anyone's looking for a 1964 Chevelle Malibu convertible, let me know. But anyway, um, you know, I'm talking to the guy who's helping us get it ready and sell it and everything. Because I don't know cars. I really don't. 
And this guy came high, uh, highly recommended from a friend. And so, you know, and he's been really good to work with so far. But, you know, he he, he knows this, this trade inside out. And um, I am just like, just give us, here's the list of all the things we've diagnosed about it. Let's do all this stuff. And we are, we're being transparent about it. You know, but I think that attitude uh, comes off as a little surprising because I don't think very many people do that. <laughs> I don't think many people are like, you know, here's all the stuff. You know what you're getting into. So an unaugmented item goes for anywhere between 50k through 300k. A good item goes for a million and a perfect and a perfect for five million. Okay. These items are mid-tier average items, though. They can go as high as 150 million. Wow. Is it, so is that something, so if I remember right, you can earn in the, the, the currency in-game. Do they allow you to buy it? Like, can you buy, can you amass currency just by, you know, paying real-world money? Day of work can get you a million if you work your butt off. Okay, that puts a perspective on it. Yeah, I've got to get back to just speaking into games in general. So I'm going to um, kind of dust off 10 ton noggin and do my game stuff over there. Um, probably, I don't know how often. We'll talk about that more in a bit here. But um, let's see, you can pay for credits and sell them to other players. Okay, okay. Interesting. But I'm looking forward to playing that um, the game I mentioned, the Tomorrow Children. Really looking forward to getting into that, um, just because partially because it's something that I can play kind of passively. Like it's a lot of fun. You can play it with other people. You can get really involved, but you can also just kind of back off for a bit, and you don't feel like you've lost something. Hundred credits is five dollars, which is three point five million. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was kind of, I was wondering about that. I was guessing it was probably going to be about uh, about a million a buck, something like that. So it's a little lower than that. Buck buys a million. But yeah, so this game used to be that way. It was it used to be free to play, and then you could buy currency. And you could specifically buy, there are two kinds of currency in this other game, the Tomorrow Children, um, and the illegal currency, quote unquote, in the story in the game, it's like money from America. You play in a, a post-apocalyptic Soviet void, um, so American weapons and tools and money are all sort of forbidden. But anyway, um, yeah, so they, they originally had it where you kind of had to buy better tools the ones that you got in game would die would work very slowly and would die very quickly and it was just a mess so the game's 40 bucks now and there's no no more purchases they're talking about doing some dlc if it goes over well and that'll be for sale which i'm totally okay with because i want to support the company but so memberships cost either eight dollars you get 200 credits or it's free and you pay 200 credits okay Well, I'm glad you're able to find a buyer, because like you're saying the other night, sound like the other guy was being kind of a, a dork about it. So, all right. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get going with the second story here. Feel free to. I mean, I can take little breaks along the way. This is actually a very short one, though. It's really short. There's a certain aspect of this one that personally I really, really like, in that. The things that you meet in the story are a little less defined and they suggest better in a better way to me the sort of nefarious, insidious nature of the quote unquote good folk. I like it. 
I've only read it once or twice, though, so maybe I'm not remembering it correctly. Let's find out. So this is called uh, Pat Diver's Ordeal. It's told by Letitia McClintock. Now, I say these stories are told by because these are actually older stories. The authors that are listed here are people who maybe revised, edited, and retold stories that had been told in other from other volumes or orally for a long time. Uh, membership gives you extra experience and loop find chance. Yep, yep, yeah. And honestly, it's funny, you know, I would not mind subscribing to this other game if it meant that um, they could support, it would support the company and they'd be able to keep content coming and, you know, pay their developers and other people a good living. So, but they're they're doing it on a PlayStation. And I think I we've been learning and talking to the folks who make the game. On Discord, um, just how much of the deal, how, how how much control the platform has over the developers. Like, I kind of knew, but I'm hearing a lot more specifics now. And it, it's really discouraging, honestly, to me. You know, like, they were going to do... A lot of people have been asking for a pre-order. They want to get it now. And not just because they're eager to get the game. There are some people in the community who live, like, in Turkey or Russia where um, because of currency issues or because of other things, the currency is unstable. If they buy it now, they might actually be able to afford it. Whereas if certain events occur and the currency shifts again, now all of a sudden they can't afford it, you know? Um, and so they've been talking about, I had no idea this was a thing, but they all get gift cards from other countries to buy them in foreign versions of the PlayStation store so that they can get them at a reasonable price. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I don't know if PlayStation would actually, I mean, they have to, because there are other games that allow subscriptions, so maybe they just didn't consider it. But anyway, in any case, uh, let's see, Pat Diver's Ordeal. Pat Diver the Tinker was a man well accustomed to a wandering life and to strange shelters. He had shared the beggar's blanket in smoky cabins. He had crouched beside the still in many a nook and corner where poutine was made on the wild Inishowen mountains. He had even slept upon the bare heather or in the ditch with no roof over him but the vault of heaven. Yet were all his nights of adventure tame and commonplace when compared with one especial night. During the day preceding that night, he had mended all the kettles and saucepans in Moville and Greencastle, and was on his way to Coldeff when night overtook him on a lonely mountain road. He knocked at one door after another, asking for a night's lodging, while he jingled the halfpence in his waistcoat pocket, but was everywhere refused. Where was the boasted hospitality of Inishowen, where, where, blah, which he had never before known to fail? It was of no use to be able to pay when people seemed so churlish. Thus thinking, he made his way toward a light, towards a light a little further on, and knocked at a cabin door. An old man and woman were seated at one, one at each side of the fire. "'Will you be pleased to give me a night's lodging, sir?' asked Pat respectfully. "'Can you tell a story?' returned the old man. "'No, sir, then. I cannot say I'm good at storytelling,' replied the puzzled tinker. "'Then you must go further, for none but them that can tell a story will get in here.' This reply was made in so decided a tone that Pat did not attempt to repeat his appeal, but turned away reluctantly to resume his weary journey. A story indeed, muttered he, old wives' fables to please the weans. As he took up his bundle of tinkering implements, he observed a barn standing rather behind the dwelling house, and aided by the rising moon, he made his way towards it. It was a clean, roomy barn with a piled up heap of straw in one corner. Here was a shelter not to be despised, so Pat crept under the straw and soon fell asleep. He could not have slept very long when he was awakened by the tramp of feet, and peeping cautiously through a crevice in his straw covering, he saw four immensely tall men enter the barn, dragging a body which they threw roughly upon the floor. 
They next lighted a fire in the middle of the barn and fastened the corpse by the feet with a great rope to a beam in the roof. One of them then began to turn it slowly before the fire. Come on, said he, addressing a gigantic fellow, the tallest of the four. I'm tired. You be to tack your turn. You be to... I'm so sorry. You be to take your turn. Fay and troth, I'll no turn him, replied the big man. There is Pat Diver under the straw. Why wouldn't he take his turn? With hideous clamor, the four men called the wretched Pat, who, seeing there was no escape, thought it was his wisest plan to come forth as he was hidden. Now, Pat, they say, said they, you'll turn the corpse, but if you let him burn, you'll be tied up there and roasted in his place. Pat's hair stood on end, and the cold perspiration poured from his forehead, but there was nothing for it but to perform his dreadful task. Seeing him fairly embarked on it, the tall men went away. Soon, however, the flame rose so high as to singe the rope, and the corpse fell with a great thud upon the fire, scattering the ashes and embers, and extracting a howl of anguish from the miserable cook, who rushed to the door and ran for his life. He ran on until he was ready to drop with fatigue. When seeing a drain overgrown with tall, rank grass, he thought he would creep in there, and lie hidden till morning. But he had not been many minutes in the drain before he heard the heavy trampling again, and the four men came up with their burden, which they laid down on the edge of the drain. I'm tired, said one to the giant. It's your turn to carry him a piece now. Fay and troth, I'll not carry him, replied he. But there's Pat Diver in the drain. Why wouldn't he come out and take his turn? Come out, Pat, come out, roared all the men, and Pat, almost dead with fright, crept out. He staggered on under the weight of the corpse until he reached Kiltown Abbey, at ruin festooned with ivy where the brown owl hooted all night long, and the forgotten dead slept around the walls under dense, matted tangles of brambles and benweed. No one ever buried there now, but Pat's tall companions turned into the wild graveyard and began to dig a grave. Pat, seeing them thus engaged, thought he might once more try to escape, and climbed up into a hawthorn tree in the fence, hoping to be hidden by the boughs. I'm tired, said the man, who's digging the grave. Here, take the spade, addressing the big man. It's your turn. Fay and troth, it's not my turn, replied he as before. There's Pat Diver in the tree. Why wouldn't he come down and take his turn? Pat came down to take the spade, but just then the cocks in the little farmyards and cabins round the abbey began to crow, and the men looked at one another. We must go, said they. And well it is for you, Pat Diver, that the cocks crowed, for they had not... You'd just have been bundled into the long grave with the corpse. Two months passed, and Pat had wandered far and wide over the country Donegal when he chanced to arrive at Rappo during the fair. Among the crowd that filled the diamond, he came suddenly upon the big man. How are you, Pat Diver? said he, bending down to look in the tinker's face. You're the advantage of me, sir, five, not the pleasure of knowing you, faltered Pat. Do you not know me, Pat? Whisper, when you go back to Inishowen, you'll have a story to tell. And that's it. It's, uh, again, I kind of hinted that a lot of these stories are a little, seem a little bit almost random in their, um, in the content, you know? It's like, there's a person, this weird thing happens, and then you're on your way. That's it. Thank you very much. Deep bow. Yeah, sorry. Oh, man, I, I do feel bad. I faltered a couple times there. So what, what you couldn't see as I was reading was that it's actually written where they tried to incorporate the Irish accent into the text, and I can't do it. I can't. I'm not going to try to do. Like, if I took some training and learned a proper variety of Irish accents, that would be awesome. It ain't going to happen. And so rather than trying to fake it, rather than trying to... Like, if I read it just as it is, 
Let me go back here real quick. Like, even that Fey and Tro is actually probably, like, translates as faith and truth, right? But, um, let's see. Let's see. We'd be pleased to give me a night's lodging, sir, asked Pat respectfully. Can you tell a story, returned the old man. What is this? Okay, we're getting rid of this one. Hang on. That's a no. That is not calming cinematics, you lie. That's more like it. Can you tell a story, returned the old man. No, then, sir, I cannot say. I, I cannot say I'm good at storytelling, replied the puzzled tinker. Then you mom just gang further, for none but them that can tell a story will get in here. <laughs> it's like, okay. Anyway, I'm sure if you read that with a proper accent, it would sound just fine. As I try to say it, it sounds like I don't know how to read. Um, and so I feel bad for tripping over some of the parts just because, like I said, I, I actually really like this story. Some poor guy just trying to have a night's sleep, sleeping in a barn, and in come a bunch of... It's interesting to me. They kind of go back and forth between talking about they're either just very tall men, or one of them may be something like a giant or something. But even then, like giants in a lot of stories are kind of a different sort of thing than to their own, right? So this just strikes me as some other aspect of the, the good folk, the hidden people, whatever you want to call them, right? What's the nah? <laughs> sorry, I lost the context. Ooh, that got loud. Sorry. Um, oh, just tall dudes wanting to hear tales. Is, tales as tall as they. Nice. Actually, I like that. But it wasn't, they weren't the ones who wanted to hear the story. It was the grumpy old guy in the house who wanted to hear the story. The The tall guys were like sitting there with a dead body. And they're like, hey, come over here and help us cook him. But then you can kind of tell, like later on, they're not eating him. They apparently like take him, they come in, they're like, <laughs> it scared him off. They take him off the fire and they go and they're just carrying him around. And then they're like, oh yeah, I guess we should bury him, right? So they go and they're going to bury him. They're like, yeah, we'll throw the other guy in too. You know, like, what are these giant, what are these very tall dudes doing carrying around a dead body in the middle of the night? They can't be out during the day. <laughs> Jerks. <laughs> yeah. They apparently can't be out during the day by one estimation. But then later he actually sees him, right? He's at some kind of fair. And there one of them is. I like how they treat him, where they he just this thing, he just leans down and is like, How are you, Pat Diver? said he, bending down to look in the tinker's face. The thing that doesn't say about when he was at the fair is that it could have actually been at night. And so if if you want to go for like where you insert rules so that they're consistent, he probably saw them at night at some fair. And uh they remembered him, or this one guy did anyway. Yeah, creepy people. But I also like the fact that they can obviously, like, they can tell he's in the room and they know him by name. It's probably one of those things that you probably don't want to have the the good folk know you by name. It just doesn't seem like a good idea, right? In, in uh, my story, I've had my main character hand off a MacGuffin to a witch for her cast a ma uh, for her cast a magical spell off of. Now you need to decide what the spell will do and how it'll affect the plot. Oh, okay. Yeah, never give your name to a fae. Yeah. So... <clears throat> But also, too, like in the stories that I've read out of this book, we go from, is it just bad juju? Yeah. We go from the very first stories where um, the good folk are uh, these little teeny guys with red hats, they're red caps, basically, right? To the, oh gosh. I'm losing it. But anyway, so this, 
I'm blanking. My memory is going as I sit here. Uh, we'll go ahead and go on to the third story here. So, um, just to emphasize the idea that uh, these people or creatures from this particular sort of branch of folklore show up as a lot of different things. Um, they're not just one thing, and I don't know if anywhere in here we're going to see the Victorian Disney-fied version of fairies, where, again, little people, little bug-like people with sparkly wings. We shall see. All right, so we're reading a story now called The Puka, translated by oh, just initials, E.W., Goblins haunt from fire or fan or mine or flood to the walks of men. All right. <clears throat> tell you what, give me just a sec. I'm actually going to take a, like, two-minute break, and I'll be right back. Be with you in a moment. Okay, there we go. Turn that down just a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so the third story is called The Puka. Get my light adjusted here. Now that the schoolmaster is abroad, there can be no question that the warm sun of education will, in the course of a very few years, dissipate those vapors of superstition whose wild and shadowy forms have from time immemorial thrown a mysterious mantle around our mountain summits, shed a darker horror through our deepest glens, 
traced some legendary tale on each unchiseled column of stone that rises on our bleatest hills, and peopled the green border of the wizard stream and the sainted well with beings of a spiritual world. While, however, the friends of Ireland cannot but be pleased in thinking that our country should, from being better informed, renounce their belief in these idle tales of superstition, to which they unfortunately have for centuries been taught to listen with delight, to the exclusion of matters more rational and more important. It is to be hoped that the two prominent features of our antiquity as a nation will not be altogether lost sight of, namely our vernacular language and those extraordinary legends which are esteemed by many as going a great length to prove from their remarkable analogy with the tales of the Eastern world our Oriental descent, although the good people still retain the most respectable footing a peasant may now travel from Cape Clear to Tanamara without encountering that once dreaded personage, a ghost. Even the Puta or Irish Goblin is not for the last forty years, as far as our recollection serves, been known to shake the dripping ooze from his hairy hide, to approach the haunts of men, or to practice, by the conscious light of the moon, like the fairies and satyrs of heathen mythology, any of those unlucky tricks upon his mortal neighbors for which he was, at one period, so much dreaded in many portions of our island. The Puta is described as a frisky, mischievous being, having such a turn for roguish fun as to induce him to be all night in wait for one Karof returning from the moor, from the pleasures of the card table, or for the frequenter of wakes. His usual appearance was that of a sturdy pony with a shaggy hide, he generally lay couched like a cat in the pathway of the unfortunate pedestrian. Then, starting between his legs, he hoisted the unlucky wretch aloft on his crupper, from which no shin-breaking rushings by stone walls, no furious driving through white thorn hedges, or life-shaking plunges down cliff and quagmire could unseat him. The first crowing of the march talk re respited the sorrowful rider who generally ended his dear bot tour by a tremendous fling from the puta's back into some deep bog hole or thorny brake, where ten thousand prickles reared their points to drink the blood of, of his bruised and broken flesh. On the other hand, he is reported to commiserate the lot of the benighted traveler, and there are some instances on record of his having gently trotted beneath the wayfaring cottager for many a mile to the neighborhood of the well-remembered cabin on the heath. Bay of Puta, in the county of Kerry, was, as its name imports, the haunt of one of those imaginary monsters. This fay or marsh belonged to Tim Dorney, a snug farmer whose ancestors for many years occupied the adjacent farm, and who honest men in that golden age never found it necessary to disturb the goblins in the favorite haunt by reclaiming his dreary abode. But when the farmer... Pardon me for a moment. Good grief. But when the farm which his grandfather tilled came into Tim Dorney's occupation, a taste for improvement and the necessary expenditure of a large and increasing family induced him to crosscut Feyaputa by drains and ditches, and two summers had hardly passed when this haunt of the wild goose and the dark mischievous goblin afforded a heavy sward of hay and firm footing for man and beast. The puta, thus be beaten up and driven from the marsh, naturally turned his thoughts to the meditation of revenge on him who, with profane hand, rent asunder that sacred veil which the superstition of ages had woven round the dreaded spot. Tim was a painstaking, industrious peasant, and accustomed to traverse his farm every night to ascertain that no neighboring cattle trespassed on his ground. One night, as he returned along the border of the marsh, he saw something shaped like a dark-colored, long-tailed pony lie in the narrow way directly across his path. And before he could slip aside to shun the lurking apparition, the puta, for it was he, suddenly started between the legs of the terrified farmer and bore him off the ground. 
The goblin rushed along with the speed of the whirlwind, and Tim's first moment of reflection was employed in a fruitless attempt to fling himself to the ground. But he found that some invisible hand had bound him to the back of his supernatural enemy. It would be tedious to recount the hard rubbings against stone walls and the wild rushings through quick-set hedges that Tim Dorney endured, while the rapidity of his flight completely deprived him of breath and utterance. At last they rushed toward a tall cliff, which frowned in horrid gloom above the deep river, and intercepted by its giant bulk, the yellow light of the moon that gilt the mountaintops quivered in the rustling foliage of the trees, and brightening in its advance, burnished the trembling waters with liquid fire. The pooter pushed with an unabated speed to the edge of the rock, then suddenly stopped as if to add to the death pang of his agonized victim by a previous view of the fearful height and the dark waves that curled among the pointed rocks below. Tim Dorney, now concluding that all of his life would be ended for him in the next plunge, yelled a shriek of unutterable dismay. The tall cliff returned the piercing sound which the scream of the startled wildfowl and the demon voice of the puta that combined the mockery of a human laughter with a wild, indescribable howl blended in horrid unison along the lonely glen. Whether the puta was satisfied with thus inflicting the pangs of a frightful death by anticipation, or that he possessed no power over human life, does not appear. But in the next moment, he started from the fearful cliff, and returning through the deep ravines and tangled underwood, to a furze break that skirted the border of a standing pool, plunged his unfortunate rider among the sharp brushes. Happing his deliverance, he heard the troubled waters of the dark pool resound of the plunge of the returning puka, beheld his uncouth figure glance darkly along the moor till the lessening form grew dimly faint in the moonshine. And the hurried splashings of his rapid hoof broke the silence of the night no more. Tim, as may naturally be supposed, made the best of his way to the cottage and being of true Malaysian origin, determined on having his revenge upon his fiendish enemy. It was a fine night in the month of August, when Tim Dorney, having sufficiently recruited himself after his adventure of wild horsemanship, walked forth, like him that hath his quarrel just, doubly armed. His heels were furnished with a pair of long-necked spurs that, that bore rowels contrived to the next forge, which could goad a rhinoceros to death. His hand wielded a loaden whip, so called from the handle being set with lead, and in the grasp of a strong man was capable of felling an ox. He whistled as he went, not for want of thought, but for his mind was brooding over a plan of revenge against the puka, who, according to his usual habit, started between the farmer's legs and bore him off. Tim, nothing loth at the abduction, just when the puta was commencing his antics, twisted the lash of the whip round his hand and leveled such blows about the goblin's ears as would have crushed any stall made of mortal penetrable stuff, while the sharp riled spurs gave ample revenge for the pointed insults of the preceding night. Dire were the tossings, deep the groans of the puta during this unmerciful ride. But Tim Dorney clung to him like a monkey until the puta lay down, outmastered by his mortal antagonist. Next night, Tim walked abroad in quest of his acquaintance. He whistled his favorite air of the Mahola to lull the suspicions of the latter who held aloof quite on his guard, eyeing the other form from his lurking place, and breaking his usual taciturnity by asking in an uncouth voice the well-remembered question, have you sharp things on? <laughs> I will na garan earth. Mm. Some years had now rolled their seasons around, and the puta seemed to have entirely forgotten his antagonist in his ancient dwelling of the marsh, when Tim Dorney had occasion to visit a gossip's sister, gossip's sister's cousin's brother-in-law, 
who had lately come home after an absence of 25 years on board a man of war. The credit side of the account sheet of the seaman's life was fraught with a copious list of wonders, all his travels history, and a pension of nine pence a day. On the debtor side stood the loss of the right arm, the closing of the starboard eye, and sundry minor details received in the duty of boarding and cutting out, with occasional tavern stuffles. Tim was highly delighted at the tough yarn of his old acquaintance, heard with a gaping wonderment the recital of a battle with a French 74 off the idol of Elba, where the relator lost his previous arm, an encounter with the Sailly Rover, which they sent down to Old Davy in a dreadful storm near the island of Malto, Malta, of voyages along the coast of Tunis, where the people are all musicians, by Tripoli famous for its wrestlers, and a journey through the desert of Barca, where the inhabitants, men and women, have dogs' heads. The ale of a neighboring Shabin greatly improved the sailor's turn for narration, and though the rain poured in torrents through the grass-grown roof of the cabin yet, the night flew on with songs and clatter, and I, the ale, was growing better. But Tim being retained that night to form one of a party that had engaged to play at cards for two hundred of herrings, and as he was a famous carol, he could not disappoint his friends, who mainly depended on Tim's address to carry off the wager. The rain had now ceased, and after grasping the sailor's hand and requesting his company on a given night at Feaputa, he departed. The moon yet obscured by heavy clouds cast a sad and sickly gleam along his path, which, winding round a precipitous descent, led into the bosom of a deep glen, where the turbid mountain torrents had swelled into muddy waves the clear and beautiful brook that erewhile had bubbled with soothing, soothing murmurs along the yellow pebbles. There was no sound on the hill save the plaintive howl of the watchdog, baying the broad round moon. The night wind slightly shook the thin foliage of the decaying wood that surmounted the steep sides of the glen. And the hoarse, hollow sound of the roaring river that would seem to a fanciful ear the boding of the voice of a water fairy echoed along the distant banks. Though Tim Dorney's education had taught him to people the loneliest scenes with beings of another life, yet he passed unappalled to the brink of the torrent, and sighed to behold that the force of the stream left him little chance of crossing over with safety. While he loitered along the bank, he was agreeably surprised to behold in a little toe which led into a ford a small horse, resembling a carry pony. He was tied by a halter, had a peline susa or straw saddle on his back, and into one of the foldings of the straw saddle was stuck a whitethorn plant. Tim, grateful for this favorable opportunity of moving homeward, had already his leg raised to mount when the titter of suppressed laughter behind a crag shook his heart with terror and excited his suspicion of the pony. He had not meddled with the whitethorn stick, for he rarely went abroad by day or night unprovoked with choice of hazel sapling. This miraculous plan, against which nothing evil can contend, well served this time of need, for retiring a little Tim Dorney bestowed so hearty a salute on the guileful Puka, for it was he, that the laughter sounds were changed into a wild howl, and as the puta disappeared along the troubled stream, the dashing waters del deluged the sounding banks. But a time arrived when the persevering goblin wreaked a cruel revenge on his hitherto fortunate adversary. It was approaching... My apologies for the music. I'm just going to keep flipping till I find something here. It was approaching the 25th of March when the farmers usually pay the rent, and Tim, who is extremely punctual in the payment of the half-year's deal, prepared to send the quantity of the last season's butter to court for that purpose. Wheel carriages were then totally unknown in that part of the country. The sliding car, indebted to no wheels, glided in the vicinity of the farms, while burdens were conveyed to more remote places on the backs of horses. Five or six neighbors at this time were setting off to transmit the produce of the dairy to court, and Tim, with four stunted nags that usually ran wild and free on the mountains, fell into their company. Each little horse was generally laden with two full bounds of butter, but one or two, whose owners were unable to furnish the even number of firkins, carried a large stone placed on the opposite side to balance the single one. 
After journeying, journeying all night on the next morning, an accident happened to Tim Dorney on his way through Mill Street that seemed the type and forerunner of the evening's misfortune. As the Terry Dragoons marched in long procession through a single street that com composes this little town, the drummer of a company of soldiers stationed in the barrack beat the doubling drum with such furious heat as set all the ponies prancing beneath their riders and butterfurkins. It happened that the nag on which Tim rode by an unfortunate curvette on the slippery pavement had his heels tripped up, and he fell under the load that lumbered on his back. The rider, whose Milesian irascibility was not much allayed at having the accident perpetrated by a red coat, drew his trusty hazel from its resting place between the furtins, and by its instantaneous application to the drummer's head, forced him to bite the dust. Though the drummer, for certain striking reasons, was no favorite with his comrades, yet a sentinel who witnessed this insult to the cloth leveled Tim with the butt end of his piece. The alarm being given, the soldiers rushed thick and fast to assault the Carry Dragoons, and as Twick rushed the townfolk to their support, the reader's imagination must supply what I would fail in delineating. It'll suffice to tell that after some broken heads and bayonet thrusts on both sides, the Redcoats retreated to their stronghold, and the triumphant Carrionians were escorted by their faithful allies to the summit of Mushroom Mountain. In the evening, the caravan came within view of Blarney Castle, while the last rays of the declining sun tinged its ivied turrets with golden hue. As the night breeze blew keen and fierce, our travelers halted at a small public house on the road to repel its chilling influence by a glass of spirits. Their delay was hardly a minute, and they hastened to overtake the horses that moved at slow pace before them. But suddenly some strange disorder began to prevail among the animals. Some fled terrified along the road. Others ran across the open common that extended to the right, and Tim Dorney's train particularly were observed to reach a fearful and perpendicular descent, from whose edge the road lay about twenty yards. Their terrified owner uttered a shriek of dread in despair when he beheld the misshapen Harry Puka urge his cattle to, to the steep cliff. It was only the work of a moment. They rushed as if by an irrepressible impulse to the fatal brink, and tumbling headlong, one instant beheld their shattered, lifeless carcasses strew the bottom of the stream-worn ravine. The pointed rocks below staved the butter cast to pieces, and their contents were wholly lost. This was but the commencement of a train of misfortune to Tim Dorney. He was finally ejected from his snug, well-improved farm. Veaputa, that had been the occupation of his family for a hundred and fifty years before, passed into the hands of strangers, and the descendants of Tim Dorney, who are homeless wanderers on earth, and such is the account, which at this day is given by the remaining members of the family of the commencement of their misfortunes. That is all. So yeah, uh, I think Puka again pops up in a lot of different forms. Uh, this one I had heard before, where it shows up as a sort of a demon pony, I guess if you will, and it's described in kind of um, oh brief terms, I guess, in the story. But you think about what it does, where it basically it, it somehow runs up, sneaks under you, picks you up, glues you to its seat, and then proceeds to grind your legs against stone walls along the road and that sort of thing. Pretty awful. Um, I think it even suggests here, thank you again, I appreciate the applause, I think it even suggests here that it doesn't just take one form, like, like it can look like several different things. I think I've actually heard of them looking like people sometimes. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of different uh, creatures, most of which seem to have some sort of intelligence that, yeah, people, this sort of weird, unseen world, right? I like this particular story because it starts off talking about something that... Um, uh, uh, I've kind of talked about on here that where, you know, it kind of gets to the source what's like. These stories used to be told as though, you know, they were kind of like it describes here. It was, oh yeah, my friend's brother's 
stepmother's maid something, you know, where it just goes down the line. These stories are handed around, but they're handed around and told as very much something like, oh yeah, this happened. It just happened to, you know, like someone, so, it's someone reliable. Here's the chain of people that it went through, but you know, like I can swear to its veracity. And that, yeah, it was early 20th century that, you know, that when um, late 19th, early 20th century, when there was definitely a strong turn towards science and rationalism and, and all that, you know, that kind of put a lot of these stories not to rest. I mean, you can you can talk to people today, happen to a friend of a friend. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, you can still talk to people today who will tell, still tell personal stories of these sorts. They may not be, I don't know, maybe not as involved. The few I've heard are a little bit more, um, like there are reasons that they don't eat uh, berries at a certain time of year because there's a certain time of year when the fairies go out and basically pee on them. <laughs> and, but they still, people, you know, it's like, oh, it's just a cute little story. But they will not go out and eat them at that time of year. They won't eat, you know, eat them early, too early in the in the spring. And so these ideas still populate people's daily lives. You know what I mean? They they may. In one conversation, I think probably be like, well, of course, you know, there are all these, you know, sort of fanciful stories and that. But then you look at how they behave and it's clearly still a part of their culture and their beliefs. Um, and this one also, unlike a lot of other things I've read, hints at the fact that there's like even back then it was known and seen that there were similarities between the stories that are told in Ireland. The things have been modernized as the Fae and the Seely Court and the Unseely Court and those sorts of things where those are newer ideas. You go back to the older stories and they have common roots with stories that come from all over the world. And that aspect of it just fascinates me. I love finding those similar similar stories uh, between far-flung places where there isn't a lot of like cultural interaction or trade or anything like that to explain why the stories show up in such similar forms when and where they do. But anyway, so that's all the reading for tonight. Um, there's still quite a bit in this book. It's not a very particularly long book, but it'll it'll keep me going for the next, oh, probably get us through fall this year. So, um, but yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, one of the reasons I read that is that a lot of the ideas that are there, um, aside from I think they're just fun stories on their own, but a lot of the ideas that are there come into my work in progress. For the idea is to t recapture that idea of folklore being something that isn't seen as stories for children or f or fantasy novels. Not that there's anything wrong with fantasy novels, but you know they're they're seen as a particular kind of thing. Letting the stories come back in as real things. So using magical realism in literature to make them seem as integrated into daily life as possible so I've got a main character uh, for example who isn't any particular creature but she has traits that come from a lot of different things and if you know some of the old uh, older stories or more far-flung stories about certain things you'll recognize like oh um, is that is that a thing this is no this is actually different than low fantasy um, magical realism, no, no, low, no, absolutely. Low fantasy also is not, definitely not a pejorative term. Magical realism is its own thing. It very distinct, it uses particular kinds of like nonlinear plot structures. Um, it uses a different kind of voice in the narrative. It takes ordinary things and tries to identify the sort of magical nature in them. Take ordinary everyday things and elevate them. And then it takes the more fantastic elements and it just presents them brick-faced. It doesn't try to explain them. It tries to make them seem very, very ordinary. So, um, and yeah, it's not, it's not even, doesn't really even have the same characteristics that a typical genre would. Whereas there are certain things in most genres where there are certain beats or structures or ideas that if you omit them, if you tell someone like, oh yeah, this is a fantasy novel, 
and then they read it and there's none of those things they'll be like well whether or not i like the story this isn't fantasy or if it's fantasy it's weird because where's the and then there's a list of things you know um not that every fantasy has to have a magic system but a magic system is sort of expected like there's some idea of some kind of you know otherworldly or 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 fantasy uh uh unreal sort of power system right you know something that lets people do things that they can't do in real life uh you had talked before about the idea of a journey and and you actually described it as like oh this doesn't really have the typical sort of journey the whole thing takes place in a city which i like i, I really like that idea um but it is something that if you're talking to people who like fantasy it's one of the call it an optional sort of a, a structural aspect that a lot of people expect is that at some point you're going to go on a quest. You're going to go on a journey, right? So, yep, so you're writing exactly, yeah, you're writing fantasy, but it's not epic fantasy. Um, it's still high fantasy. Yep, exactly. You know? So, like, the character I'm describing in in um, the, the thing I'm working on um, she's raised in this place that's out in the redwoods on the north coast of California. It's not readily accessible to us. You have to know how to get there. And there's her, her dad. Her mom died uh, in childbirth. Her dad is... It's not. This is not told in the story, but he's actually very, very old. He doesn't look it. He doesn't act it. He's very much like you know one of the hidden people or... Call him one of the hidden people, one of the fae, one of the uh, the good folk, whatever you want to call him. But he's basically from that world. But he lives in a little cabin out in the redwoods. And he, uh, the the example I gave before is that he has like a really nice hi-fi system because he still is in touch with the modern world. He does not dress like someone out of Victorian culture, right? He's adapted how he dresses over many, 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 many years, many centuries. Um. So he still looks relatively, not really modern, but he doesn't look antiquated at the same time. Neither does his daughter, this character. You know, she wears like a blue hoodie and a print t-shirt and has red velvet vans and doesn't tend to wear socks. And um, the things that make her stand out are that her hair is just a shocking white, which you see. like that. That's actually something I don't see talked about a lot, but this is my... Um, in a weird this is gonna sound weird maybe that's okay this is my white haired girl story you see these a lot um there's a figure that is somehow sort of mysterious or otherworldly and she has typically young and she has white hair and it's not always a sign of purity right it's so easy to assume that you, you know the white hair that it's some sort of mark of you know um oh like virginal purity or something like that and that's not always true it's absolutely not always true um but yeah so that's what she is uh and she has like i said other traits um her eyes look unusual but i'm working very hard not to say exactly how they look in the story because i don't want it to be just my idea of what they look like i want to show the other characters in the story looking at her and finally getting to look at her without these goggles that she tends to wear that she bought at a, a hardware store and when they see her without them they look and they're like what the heck and they can't articulate what it is that looks unusual but everyone has a slightly different reaction when they see her so those are the outward signs there are other things too she has arithmomania she she counts things obsessively um she tends to attract moths like you, you know, she'll you'll see moths flitting about her. She typically doesn't go on the daytime. Not that she can't. It's not that she, you know, but it does make her feel unwell. Um. So anyway, she's got all these things, and uh, she has one trait in particular that we see in chapter one. Um, that I don't over, try not to over explain. Again, I just show what happens between her and this guy who's the main character who we see at the very beginning of the book that they're married um, they're young they're living together and something's wrong and then she does something and it it you know, it's hard to describe without actually reading it and I don't want to read it till I actually have the chapter polished and then maybe I'll read my chapter one I don't know we'll see 
But anyway, the whole point of what I was saying there, though, is that, like, yeah, she is absolutely tied to a lot of these old ideas. But my my hypothesis in all this is that we got the stories around the hidden people wrong, that all the things that we say about them, all the stories that we tell have some element of truth, but it's distorted either by fear of them or by a desire to belittle them. And so what they really are is going to be something that's made up both of the stories that we tell and some other underlying system and culture that doesn't can't possibly come out on the page like maybe i could write my own my own personal i'm gonna make up my story and i'm gonna make up an encyclopedia about how it all works but to me that's not very interesting like i kind of do it um in the background but you only get to see these little glimpses you know you get this you know the first night that the main character meets her uh you know she's acting kind of funny she seems to be following him around for some reason and he realizes that he's got one eye where he can kind of see her in the dark without really knowing why. He can just, she keeps, like, every time, seems like she's kind of trying to get his attention, but then she'll step off into the shadows, and he can still kind of follow her. And, there, you know, there's a reason for this. Well, anyway. Uh, let's see. So you do the moth thing. Yes, moths actually play some really cool roles in a lot of, a lot of lore. Uh, you've had four giant moths flying into your room this summer. They don't go anywhere else in the house. That is really cool. I love that. That that in itself is like a micro story. That's a really, really good story. Polishing is for nerds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, It's this isn't even just a matter of polishing. This it is that I've got to decide what exactly it is that happens and then get it out of the back of my brain into the front of the brain where I can write it. So that particular description, the back to front brain thing, I don't know about you. So that's something I recently just learned about. Um, first draft, only draft. <laughs> Isaac Asimov, right? Uh, did you ever hear that story about him? He was a little bit of a braggart, and that's putting it mildly. Um, you know, I think he had some, sort. you know, he obviously had some kind of like uh, social relatability issues, shall we say. Yeah, so he would basically, um, he he would said that he would write his stories in one go at 80 words a minute. He would just sit down, at the, and it's a typewriter. This is like a manual typewriter he's using way back when. And he would just, he just cranked the thing out. He typed super fast on these things, which if you've ever used a manual typewriter, that's your first opportunity to call BS on his story, because a lot of them, you couldn't get the mechanisms to work that fast. Um very very few people probably could but anyway yeah so he claimed that most of his work he just wrote in one go just sitting down he'd sit down and write 80 words a minute and there it came and which also i just don't buy even here's the thing even if he did something pretty close to that even if they were 80 percent done even 70 percent done i'm like okay a i can tell personally personal opinion i don't like his prose at all i found it really difficult to read his work growing up and so I didn't. I read it, uh, started in a couple things. I think I read some short works and it was like, ugh, done. Um, but yeah, most people, most mere mortals take pride in the fact that, yeah, you're not going to get that done in the first go. Everyone has their own thing, right? I don't know. How about you? So I, I have found that I write, I, when I say I write non-linearly, that is an understatement. I write in such a weird, I pile up ideas on the page until I have to then sort them out and string them out kind of like, I've actually printed the pages and strung them out all over a table just so it can kind of make sense of stuff. You know, it all is stuff in the world, but it's like, okay, that's, that's fine, but how do I tell it? Do you tend to write pretty linearly? Do you go chapter to chapter or do you jump around a lot? Because I could not, if you, if I had to write something linearly, like if I had to, like TV writers would do, where they're going to write a serial and they have, maybe they have the idea for the whole arc, but they haven't written it all. And then they have to just do it as they go. You've only written the one book and you've just been pantsing it. Yep. Yeah. More power to you. So necessarily linear. Yeah. And that's how my wife writes too. She sits down and she writes. <laughs> and she goes back and edits and I'm like I, I don't do that 
my brain does not do that. So anyway, so the front to back brain thing, um, I'm not, I've not been diagnosed with ADHD, but I suspect, I suspect I have it for many, many reasons. One of the ones I heard recently from, um, uh, uh, was two things really. One of them was the, the way people with ADHD perceive time being that they have no right at least a greatly diminished sense of future events everything is imminent which explains a lot about why like i'm not a lazy person i work long hours i work really hard but i also tend to work best when i am presented with a really tight deadline and suddenly i'm panicking you know uh it's not always neglect a lot of the times it'll be like, you know, I can sit down and try to do something, but until the deadline is imminent, it doesn't actually wake up my brain enough to actually get whatever it is done, you know? Um, the other one, even more so though, this idea that we tend to accumulate memory or not, I don't know about memory, but knowledge, things we've, facts that we've acquired and the reasoning and whatnot that goes towards the back of the brain, whereas the executive portion is at the front. Maybe I've reversed that. I may have gotten that wrong. Reverse it if it's wrong, but you get the idea. And that people with ADHD have a sort of a gap between the front to back brain. So you can have something in your knowledge base. You can have something that you know, that you know really well, and you can't act on it. And if that does not describe the cloud I get, the brain fog that happens when I sit down to write most of the time, hence the, the stream title, Ken Can't Write. That perfectly describes this whole, yeah, no, I know what's going on. I love this story. I'm so eager to tell it. I'm so excited. Sit down and then, oh, well, hell. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to sit here for a couple hours and just basically go, oh, this sucks. Like, I know I've written other things. I know I've done this done. Why won't the idea come forward? And that's like I was describing, someone asked a question on the last stream about what do you do when you're stuck? And I kind of listed off a few things. And that's why one of those things exists. When I have to like write a journal entry about what I'm writing, where I, instead of writing the thing itself, I have to write about what I'm writing and then suddenly it turns into the text. It's like I have to sneak up on my own brain just to be able to get the idea out. It's no fun, let me tell you. Oh man. So let's see, you'd say the main quality of writing is that you're very picky about detail. There's something in a scene you're excited about writing, the idea of the scene, basically, and everything else is a chore. Yeah, no, I recognize that too. Yep. So you tend to be an underwriter. That's not such a terrible thing for today's audiences though, right? Boy, I've been reading a lot tonight. My voice is all squeaky. <laughs> anyway, that's not such a terrible thing for modern audiences. Like if you can carry off the idea you're going for, and the rest of the text is pretty minimal and gets you there. And that's that's all it does. More power to you, you know? Like, that that can, I would, it's not necessarily gonna be a good trait. Maybe, you know, it's kind of, I'm sure it can be a chore at the same time. But you know, maybe it's something that you kind of lean into just because you hear it all the time, you know? People have such limited attention spans these days. Although at the same time, it's good to challenge that notion too, right? Like people talk about how, oh yeah, you know, keep everything short and all that. People have very limited attention spans. Have you ever sat down, like we, people who say that, you kind of have to ask them, have you ever seen the internet? Have you ever sat down to look up where to get dinner and suddenly it's 4 a.m. and you're on Wikipedia learning about um, like molecular gastronomy and you're looking up restaurants where you can get served you know weird like herb flavored foam and gelatinous little cubes of gelatin you know that that you, you know what i'm saying like you go suddenly it's like hours 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 later and you're off on some bizarre tangent that you never intended to go on like it's not a problem of attention span i don't think i think it's largely a problem of um well who knows but it's 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 not just people having limited attention spans. It's people not really being able to buy into or grasp onto um, certain kinds of ideas anymore. So I think you have to adopt the style. But I think if you adapt your style really well, I think you can actually people appreciate it when you go long, 
you know what I mean? Um, fan fiction too. So I don't know if Nikki's still on here. Nikki, who was on here earlier, uh, pointed out a fan fiction. Um, I call it a novel, I guess. It, it's probably we need some new words for some of these forms, you know. But it was a, I believe it's called Worm. And I should remember this, but again, talk about ADHD brain. I can't remember names. Um, but this thing is just fantastically long. It's been going on for I don't know how long. Um, you know, comic book series. Um, you know, all these things like if, if now I know that there's a lot of toxicity in the Star Wars fandom, because every time they make a movie, there's some, some section out there that wants to burn it to the ground. Um, but even then, if, if you continue to either make series or novels or comics or something in that universe, you could go and go and go. In fact, favorite one of my favorite Star Wars things I've seen recently was something that they had on Disney it was all these different anime studios that did different Star Wars stories now some of them some of them weren't great I did or at least I didn't like them but I tell you the ones that I enjoyed I really really liked there was some really really good storytelling in there really cool artwork too you know where I'm very cool uh web series yeah yeah fair enough I think that accurately describes it But yeah, like how long is Worm? Like I don't, I don't even, I can't even quantify it. But it is really, 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 um, it's a really long story. I've been reading it here and there, just one chapter at a time, and kind of having fun with it. But I'm not very far in at all. So uh, Clone Wars was legitimately amazing, right? Like there are all these different. Uh, personally, I'm a huge fan of the Road One offshoot, and I'm I'm. What's the name? What's the is Seth there? No. Oh shoot! The new right? Ugh. Let me see if I can find it. There's another series coming out here. A series or a movie? I think it's just a movie. Andor. Yeah, Andor is coming out. Man, I am on board for that. Oh, and Homestuck is a maximalist web series in that style, too. I've heard of Homestuck. I don't know what it is, but I, that name's actually familiar. I'm doodling. Yeah, yeah, it even looks familiar. Fun. Oh, you know where I think I've actually heard of it. Yep. I know I haven't played him yet, but the games are on my wish list. How fun. Yeah. It's a thing you would not recommend getting into. <laughs> it was good, but it is long. Um, I've heard people say the same things too about like uh, One Piece, I think it is, which is not my style of anime anyway. But like, if you try to start One Piece at this point, it's like, oh man, good luck. Oh, hey, that reminds me. Actually, in terms of like uh, fairy lore, folklore, that kind of thing, I got another recommendation here. Let me look it up. Um, based on a manga. The, and the manga, I've not read the whole manga yet. Um, what I've read has been really enjoyable. And they are now releasing episodes of the anime on Crunchyroll. And I have to say, uh, I'm really surprised by the way they're telling the story in the anime. Like, in the best way. Trying to pull this up without actually starting it. You may hear some noise in the background. I would just like to see the... Uh... All right. re 
Restream, which I use to broadcast out to like four different sites at once, always congratulates me when, like, hey, congratulations, you've got a hundred messages today. It's like, thanks. At some point, that needs to go away. Uh, you started outlining a bit because you're getting close to the end and there's just nothing there. That is a fun thing. <laughs> well, I have an image from this that I'll put up here. But, um, I'll see if I can find a trailer while I am showing this. Where did my window go? There we go. Do away with the lovely pictures of Ireland. There we go. So it's called The Girl from the Other Side. It is strongly influenced by European Western folklore sort of themes. Um, really minimalistically told. Um, it is the story of, she refers to, so the little girl's name is Shiva. She, we don't know really where she came from or what's the deal with her. Uh, but this is, she just refers to him as sensei. There's some sort of curse that seems to be overtaking people, and he is someone who has been affected by this curse. Uh, they can't touch one another. He's afraid of cursing her somehow. And the story very quickly goes into some really good, like, sort of dark, mysterious territory. It's, it's not, when I say dark, it's not, like, graphic or anything. But when they go, um, there are others like him in the woods who seem to know more than he does, and he's still trying to figure things out. Those creatures are definitely darker looking. They look more like something, um, more like creatures out of some kind of dark legends. Um, and they take him to this lake where they go to meet Mother. <laughs> and the way they do that scene, both in the manga and in the anime, it's, it's not the most obvious thing like when you watch it in the anime especially you're like what is going on but i actually like that aspect of it it leaves you with more of a feeling about what's going on than distinct ideas i mean he did a pretty clear idea of you know what he's worried about um you know but it also this idea that mother in the story doesn't actually speak you just get these impressions so it tells you the story in a way that reflects what's going on in the it's really good. Really, really good. So, uh, go look it up. Um, they've only got three episodes out so far, which means there isn't a ton to watch, but at the same time, if you turns out you like it, hey, you have something to look forward to as they release more episodes. Yeah, Mother is definitely interesting. I think they handle Mother <laughs> really well in the story. Not everyone will like it, um, because so many things these days will do will introduce certain personas by trying to make them um as visibly creepy or unusual or disturbing as possible and they don't go that route here and so yeah but i liked what they do good old-fashioned storytelling uh let's see anyway yeah so i was going to see if i could find a trailer let me see if i can find that yeah okay you can hear a little bit of the voice starting there and pause the music i'm playing so that we can listen to what's in the trailer which i think this music's kind of like worn out it's welcome anyway so there we go uh, there's no real main conflict in your story other than civil being separated from the witch, you suppose. So um, that may be the problem. It could be. Um, boy, there's so many different ways you can go with that, right? And so when I say this, I want to be really clear. Like, I'm just saying this as a reader, right? Not as a, I'm not trying to be very careful about the idea of trying to give advice. I read a lot of stories that don't seem to have a lot of structure that present what's valuable in them in terms of the characters and um, 
like sometimes there isn't really a great neat and tidy sort of a resolution. Now, if you want one in your story, I get that too, where it's like, okay, maybe there isn't, maybe there isn't a sort of moment of truth for your character where they have to decide one thing or another, or will they win? Won't they win? Will they choose this? Will they choose that? Um, but it, it, I'll tell you, it sure sounded the other night like you were building up to that sort of thing. I don't know how the rest of the year, you said that you had like 40,000 words. I have no idea how the rest of it goes. But what you described in this, this person having a turn, an inner turn, where they went, wait a minute, and they saw this, you were describing this evil God that they no longer saw as evil because they were the only ones willing to offer love to people who were uh, these, these people who had been disfigured or, or, you know, sort of you get the, I got the general idea of an outcast uh, sort of an idea. And they present this idea. They're really excited by it and they present it to other people and it's rejected. And so it raises the question, like, what has happened since that was going on to when at the end, like, you, I mean, the, the, the natural question, the first thing that comes up in my own mind is, are they going to stick to that or are they going to turn away from it? Another one might be they learn something even deeper about this deity that they worship and they're wondering, wait a minute, was I correct? Was I wrong? And then that still dovetails with the idea of, do I, you know, do I keep going? Do I stop? It could be um, they're at odds with someone else, some other character who they see this deity different ways and they're trying to come together, but this is pushing them apart. Like, you know what I mean? It's like there's so many, based on the little bit you've described in terms of where the initial sort of tension comes from in the story. Like, um, but anyway, I wish you, I wish you well with it. I hope you find something that makes you really happy with it that you're excited to tell. But I think I, I think you have options, definitely. Got a, got a lot of different ways you can go with that. Okay, let me get the screen switched over here again. And I'll play the trailer for Girl from the Other Side. I don't know that I've seen this version of the trailer either, so I might be a little surprised. We'll see. Oh. <laughs> Watashiwa あたし君は大丈夫だ。君は大丈夫だ。私が必ず there you go. To me, it's been one of the more enjoyable uh, things I've read and watched within the last year or so. Um, other things would be uh, Keep Your Hands Off Azokin, which is entirely different, but is really, really fun. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, do check that out, too. Have I ever seen Mushishi? Yes, I have. That is a... You know what? I don't think I finished watching the whole series. 
just because I think that the service, I happen to be watching it on at the time, like, that you know how they do these days. You watch something, you're, sometimes you get halfway through and whoop, they remove, you know, it goes off the, you know, Netflix removes it or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, lots and lots of really good, interesting insights into Japanese folklore in that. You know what's funny is there's this anime from the 80s. It was the number one series for a long time. Uh, and it's absolutely goofy. It's called Urusei Yatsura. Uh, those obnoxious aliens. And it's about this uh, girl who comes from this uh, outer space. And she's an oni, a Japanese sort of an ogre. And her whole family is her dad is some important ogre guy. And they're invading Earth, and they challenge uh, this this the main character, this absolute waste of a guy, to a game of tag, and he wins the game of tag, and the rest of the show is basically you know like she thinks based on something he says when he wins, that he's proposing to her and that they're going to get married, and he's like no 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 I want to be free and and basically date you know whoever I want, and the the tension is it, it is really it's meant to be comedy it's it's a very silly series however most episodes are based on some aspect of japanese folklore folklore and religion and those sorts of things it's a really interesting like it's not the usual way you would expect to learn about some of these things but um when it was released to dvd back in the late 90s they had actual liner notes that came with each disc that would explain like they had episode guides that would talk about the different aspects of lore that you would see in each episode it was amazing um i haven't seen anyone do that since i kind of wish they would it was really cool i think mushishi is it's i mean if you know between hbo and hulu and crunchyroll and um funimation is no more or at least they were merged into crunchyroll pretty sure it's going to be out there somewhere but um, yeah I have to pick that one up again that was definitely a good one this one's really different uh, you know when people talk about anime I think it's easy to fall into a lot of the like you know what a lot of anime is the thing that makes it so popular these days a lot of the usual anime tropes. And then there are the stories that just don't follow any of them. Um, Hibane Renmei. If you've never seen that. I'm going to type the name in chat because not all the names translate very well. Hibane Renmei. It was another really, really good one. Uh, one I really, really enjoyed. I actually got it on uh, DVD. I kind of wish they would release it on Blu-ray. Maybe they have. I haven't looked. Uh, it's another one that is folklore. Actually, it kind of it, it it falls into that line between. I think like you were talking about something that might be low fantasy, magical realism. It takes place in a world where um, it's like all the people in this world have wings. They're not really angels. One of the the main images from this. Let's just look it up. Whoops, no, we don't want that. Pause. One of the main images is this girl with the dark hair who has angel's wings, who's also smoking a cigarette. That's her, you can see her there in some of the shots. So it takes the idea of that they it obviously uses some some call it angelic imagery, right? And then it subverts it. It makes it so that it's not your standard sort of thing, you know. So it's very like they live in this kind of a drab school where they take in kids and take care of them. Um, she smokes, <laughs> you know, they've got chores to do. And it leaves you feeling like, well, what world are we in here? And when one of the new ones appears, so the main character who's seen at the end of the table here, Raka, uh, when she first appears, she comes out of this egg that just kind of appears in the in the hallway in this building. 
they didn't happen to notice it growing. And now it takes, it's like floor to ceiling. And she comes out and it tells a really good emotional character based story while at the same time playing with the like, what is this world and what's going on? What are the rules and what are the different? Um, yeah, it's a really, really good one. If you know some more classic anime, the art style is going to look familiar from a series called Lane. Um, it is the same artist who did both series. So this is, I think, a better note. Yeah, that serial experiments lane. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say, this is definitely a more popular series that he did. Um, High Many Renme is really, really good, too. And a little aside, the soundtrack for High Many Renme, the music was done by the same composer who did the music for Shadow of the Colossus. And there's some similarities there in the music. Um, really, really good. Uh, I actually really enjoy the soundtrack to both of those two. It's a small creative world. All right. Well, I think I'm going to get to writing sprints because um, the way this is going to, or rather the way this has gone tonight in terms of when I got started and all that, uh, it's super late again. I don't want to be up all night. I haven't eaten dinner. I barely ate lunch today. <laughs> And so after I'm done streaming, I'm going to go out and get like, you know, late night burrito at some 24 hour place. Uh, so I don't want late night burrito to be a breakfast burrito. Um, so you know, get things switched around here. I think we're going to go refresh my cup of tea so that my voice does not wear out any more than it already has. And I'll get writing. Um, and I hope you're writing too. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, so a little feedback. So I play white noise during the writing sprints part because to me it's less distracting. And I want some kind of sound on the stream. I trust that people don't actually like the sound. They'll just turn it down, right? Does it help you? Is it a hindrance? Do you not care? Like, just curious about opinions there. In the meantime, just for the in-between, I'm going to find some other station to play here. Don't care. Okay, cool. That is far better and useful feedback to me, so thankful. But that, yeah, is far better than, I hate it. Please don't do that. I find it relaxing. It kind of, like... It's better than silence because if I have silence, then things like cars outside are going to come in and people around the house. Um, but it isn't distracting like music would be. And I'm not finding. Oh, there we go. I'll try this one. See how it goes. All right, I'm going to put up the intermission screen for just a few minutes while I get set up, and I will be back shortly. See you then.
All right, didn't set up for a few riding sprints here. See how many you get through tonight. For my part, I'm just moving ahead to the next thing that I haven't looked at for a while to see if the ideas that are in it are anything I want to keep, anything I want to try to build on, see what kind of problems exist, and we'll just keep moving forward. Let's see. You know, it's made a big deal about the white noise. I think for the first little bit tonight, I'm going to just try leaving the music going. See how it goes. Go with the mood. Go with whatever works each time you put your butt in the chair and try to write, I guess. Alright, let me check the timer. Whoop! Cat going across behind my monitors there. I don't know if you can see things shaking, but... He is on to something. He thinks something is outside, and he's running in circles around the house trying to find it. I'm going to have to put up a barricade. First, if I put up a barricade, there's a fairly good chance he'll just knock it over. I'll try that. Um, do, 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 do. What else? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, yes, the timer. Let's check that. That is not the right timer. Looks good. Get that set up. Okay. Um, so the way this will work, I'll do 20 minutes of writing, or from, in my case, 20 minutes of light, fiddly ed editing. Um, <clears throat> And I guess I should not, whatever I'm working on. Hey, it's all progress. But anyway, and then, yeah, uh, five or so minutes of just resting, stretching, and conversation in between. So take care. I'll see you. In see you in 20 minutes.
My bad, I didn't realize setting up the timer for the next uh, little bit would actually just activate it right away there. That's okay. So how'd it go? Hopefully you had a good sprint. Mine, you can see, was a mix of uh, dealing with technical issues and um, just a little bit of editing. I uh, remember, see, I remember Sunday. Someday I wanted to start a stream here, but just gave up and went to Discord instead. Oh well, never too late to start. How? But then again, I mean, how things go on Discord for you if it's working out well, you know. So, uh, for me personally, I don't like being beholden to any one platform. So I'm using a service called Restream.io. Um, what? Well, you think you finally fixed your outline for the next five thousand words or so? Hey, awesome! That's really cool. Good deal. Congrats on the progress. Still no satisfying ending, though. Give it time. It'll sneak up on you. It's one of those things. Maybe try just free writing. Like, write about anything in your story. Just blah, blah, blah for a while. And sometimes you'll, like, I don't know. what. Sometimes if I do that, I'll trip over the next thing. I don't know about you. I have to keep a voice recorder by my bed so that if I wake up and, like, something like that has hit me, I can just say it. I don't have to get up and actually write it down. Because sometimes that's how it happens, too. Um, let's see. Oh, you uh, wanted to stream there. Oh, so yeah, I was talking about Restream. So Restream, you can stream to like, I stream out to four different places. I go to Twitch and YouTube, but also Facebook. Facebook, I don't know if I'm going to keep, honestly. Um, more on that in a minute. But anyway, Facebook and then also Twitter, actually. So Twitter, I don't know if anyone remembers, but they bought a service... Uh, what the heck was that called? Do, 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 do. They bought the service where people would do these weird little streams and it would publish your location as well as your stream content. Um, and it was meant to be kind of like a short video format, uh, with geo tags and that kind of thing. But anyway, they bought it. Oh, Periscope is what it was called. They bought it and then it just wasn't doing well and they shut it down. Um, but they retained the technology for streaming. So now you can actually stream to Twitter, to Twitter. It'll show up as a post and people can go and click on the post and actually see your stream. So it's kind of fun. Uh, if you're not actively thinking about something, you don't get ideas. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably true for me too. I tend to, th not that I have a incredibly one-track mind, but I tend to think about this a lot. And because uh, for me, it's it's associated with the music that I listen to. I wish I could just play my playlist on the stream, but obviously it's all licensed. There's no way I could get away with that. I would just they would shut it down. Um, but anyway, so even if I'm listening to a song or something, like ideas will still pop up. So, but yeah, well, whatever works for you. Hope you're able to, you know, I trust you can do it. I trust you'll get there. It's just going to take a little time. Just stay in motion. That seems to be the thing. Writers and sharks. Vital that they stay in motion to survive. So, yeah, the Facebook thing, I don't know that I'm actually going to... Uh, stick with that because I think they actually shut down my stream tonight probably because of the music I don't know that Pretzel Rocks is licensed for Facebook because last time after the stream I got a message on Facebook saying yeah we had to mute parts of it because of licensing issues I'm like oh like I didn't even think about that because um, the music on Pretzel Rocks is for Twitch and YouTube only the end that's it That's okay. We'll take a little longer break. Uh, yeah. So if Facebook's going to be that way, if, you know, things that I do on, if, if I have to be so darn careful about, you know, just trying to have some, some simple background music, um, not even like mainstream anything. If they're going to be that fussy about it, forget it. <laughs> it's, I don't think anyone really watches on there anyway. And it's funny for writers, Facebook for a long time was a really important platform. It was one of the main places that people would 
stay in touch with their readers. I think for a lot of people, it still is. Um, but I don't think it's... I don't know that has a lot of forward potential, you know what I mean? I don't know if it's going places. Seems like it's been relegated now to, you know, um, let's just say a certain kind of audience that maybe isn't really into per technology moving forward. That's all. But it's a nice thing about using that, like a, a, a multi-streaming service, is you never know when, where you're going to find people who, you, you know, who <laughs> to chat with or whatever. So, um, you know, it's good to kind of spread things out a little bit. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, um, it, it looks a little bit of a mess right now because normally the, the black and the lighter colored keys are not the norm. I've got a set of brand new pbt uh double shot keycaps to put on this thing um but i don't have a backed up keyboard and i the next when i actually switch out all the keycaps i want to take the thing apart i really want to detail it it's, it's due for a deep clean um so until i get another keyboard built <laughs> so that i have a backup this is going to be it for a while um but these were from a uh another i got them cheap basically they're from a t-tap set where all the uh the light the full t-tap set with a lot of the extras and the alternates and special symbols and all that were just sold out unfortunately and because of that the the you know, just the tour tees were really cheap they're like 15 bucks or something for some what are nice keycaps in terms of their their feel and durability and all that um this is the last keyboard that I bought as a like an off the shelf. Um, it's actually, I think, if you know custom keyboards, you probably know uh, Kono. Uh, I think, was it, no, it's not Kono. What was it? Kobo. It's actually the name of the company. So Kobo is this company that does traditional Japanese lacquer work uh, keyboard cases. So this is like. Um, layers of red lacquer work with little like, gold flecks in it um not as not particularly expensive for keyboard stuff you know and uh yeah i i really like it too really happy with it um i've got a keyboard group by that is supposed to ship within the next say month here it's been going on for well over a year now um that's probably going to become my main once I get that one together. I've got some really nice switches. Uh, I don't think I'm going to mess with the lube on the switches or anything. I'm just going to put them in as is. And uh, some nice keycaps. And uh, yeah, we'll get that going. And then once I have that one set up, then I'll be able to take this one, clean it out, and use it for some other things. But I think I've got probably... I'm new at keyboard stuff. I've been trying out different things just to kind of learn the ins and outs of it. I've probably got three or four different keyboards of various kinds that are waiting for work out in my garage, which right now is too hot to work in. So I'll probably get back into it around the fall. Um, I've got well over, I've probably got easily 200 switches I've got to hand loom for the various builds. That's going to take forever. Uh, but I've got a wireless to one, one to use with my phone. I've got a one that I'm probably going to give to my wife and or daughter to use. All just different experiments. And then I've got one of actually, I got my first through hole board that I'm going to have to learn to solder. So, and even better, I instead of just doing straight through hole soldering, I got some sockets so I can turn it into a, a hot swap board. That'll be fun. Got the soldering iron out there already and everything. I just got to find a good way to practice and get busy. That one I'm really looking forward to because the kit I got is very technical looking. It doesn't come with a case or anything. Like, I'll find a little case for it. Um, but it's got a lot of exposed circuitry. And then the keycaps I found for it have, like, alternate... Uh, the legends have, like, Russian symbols on them. It just it looks really cool. It looks like something you're going to use to enter a secret bunker or something. I don't know. Should be fun.
Uh, let's see, in the writing tonight, it's going okay, as usual. I'm not thrilled with what I'm writing, but it... Like I said, the, the main thing is straightening, at this point, is straightening out the ideas. I'll get little snippets of prose that I might like or I might hate. But if I can get each idea identified and kind of get the flow, then I'll worry about polishing the prose later. I don't like leaving it very far behind, though. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, about this, whether you edit, you know, how much do you edit, when do you edit, how many revisions do you do? Even for a first draft, I have a really hard time leaving it alone. I have a terrible time uh, walking away from prose that I think sounds goofy or boring or cliche or whatever. If I want to get some version, some essence of the uh, the final thing on the page in the in the first draft. Even though it'll definitely go through a million and one revisions afterwards. People who write, you know, literary is a term that, that is misused because a lot of people will use it to try to infer some kind of like innately higher quality. There's a snootiness that goes along with it, right? And that's not what I mean. It's more just the way you structure your story and what you focus on characters versus plot or how you focus on them and the voice you use and a willingness to do things that will be more difficult for the audience to read, but maybe also more rewarding for the ones who stick around and do. A lot of the writers who write that kind of stuff, they do it sentence by sentence by sentence. It's not like a rough draft and then go back and make it pretty, you know, add the... the polish to the prose later they're basing it like they're just doing it one sentence at a time I don't think I can really do that I don't think that would work very well alright getting down to it here let it finish out because apparently if I change the timer mid stream sometimes it updates we got okay Another 20 minutes here. It seems to be a good time. It goes by quickly, but not so quickly that it feels like I get interrupted in my work. I think if I made it any longer, I'd feel like I'd probably get a little bored or my brain would start to wander off by the end. So maybe that's the magic time for me. All right, uh, here we go. Another sprint. Happy writing, and I'll talk to you again in 20 minutes.
All right, right after the deadline that time. <clears throat> Actually, I feel okay about some of the stuff I wrote this time, for my usual. Um, but that problem with not being able to see my work, or, or any writer, I think, not being able to see their own work as they write it, it works both ways. So even though I feel okay about what I just wrote, I could combine a month or so and look at it and go, ugh, I'm like, what was I thinking? We'll see. Good enough for now. Hi, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good night or good morning. I have no idea where you are, so I don't know which it is. Good time either way. Appreciate your stopping by. Let's get the in-between countdown timer going here.
almost 1 a.m. for you. We might be in a similar time zone. It is... Yeah, it's just about 1 for me, too. West Coast represent, right? Yep. Yep. I'm in the great Pacific Northwest. Only ever lived up and down the west side of the, the U.S. Oh, hey, what part of California? If you don't mind. And then, you know, you don't want to say because it's a stream and who am I? I'm some rando on the internet. That's cool. Um, the reason I ask is, so I was born and raised in far northern California. So up uh, Humboldt County. Lived there for Orange County. Okay. Opposite end. How's life down in Orange? Uh, how are things down there right now? Yeah, we're, I lived in the area of California that people forgot was part of California. <laughs> so, nice spot. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, grew up with redwood trees and forests, like, in my backyard. But just a different kind of California than, uh, than most people think of. Nice there, but a bit hot lately. Yeah, yeah. Really shouldn't complain for us. No, I get where you're coming from. Been that way around here, too. I'm in Oregon now. Um, it's not been as bad. Like, yeah, I, I kind of get what you mean. Like, if you look around what's been going on in, say, England or other parts of the U.S., um, you know, it has been absolutely roasting. Oh, what do I mean by vampiric quality? That's a good question. And actually, thanks for the feedback. Like, if that's not clear, then it, it needs some work. So here's the thing. Um, so the main character, Gabe, his dad is... He's a creep for reasons we'll see later. Um, he's the sort of person, though, that, like... This isn't anything against car people. There are lots of people out there who love classic cars and that kind of thing, and it's it's fine. But classic cars have this weird effect on people. Like, I grew up around them, and my dad was always kind of in that world. And so I would see kind of how what it would do to people, like how it could change them. What I'm getting across here is that there are a lot of people who they love the cars, but they were never able to get one. It's associated with what they see as like just this beautiful, free, energetic, and hopeful time of life, but maybe they never got that car that they were hoping for. It's sort of an unfulfilled element of their life. There are lots and lots of people like that. And I would observe that people would who had the cars would show up and it would rekindle something in them of that past, right? It would bring forward this idea of like, oh my gosh, you know, like friend of mine had one of these or my dad had one or I always wanted one of these or maybe even yeah like I I had one I man I cried the day I had to sell it lots of stories like that and so there to me the people who thrive on that kind of thing they like driving around and showing off the car and they kind of feed off the admiration of other people you know so the the, the car has this quality where it takes these sort of long dormant or even dead sense of hope and and that in people and they kind of feed off it you know what I mean like um it gives them a little bit of a boost for people to come along and tell them their story of how they either had it and lost it or never got to have one or you know it's such a common thing and so yeah to me it's like the car has this quality that's a little bit like a vampire where it takes something in this case i'm mixing ideas here so eh, you know first time on the page so maybe it'll change but um it takes this idea of people and their dead hopes they're a little sort of you know so there's this notion of things coming back from the dead so there's the undead part and then him feeding off of them well that that's that's kind of like uh you know, that that's that, that there's something semi vampiric about that, even if it's psychological or emotional. Oh, thanks. Yep. That's I know. I, I live sort of in admiration of people who do it by word count goals. 
Um, and I could do something like, I could probably track how many words I typed out tonight, but because I write in layers and it's nonlinear, it's so hard to figure out where the heck I am at any given point. Like, I don't know what's really going to be part of the book and what isn't. I just got to keep going. The most important thing is just to keep going. So, um, yeah, so the story I'm writing combines, it's told through the point of view of someone that's very sort of, uh, hopefully familiar and everyday um, but there's an aspect of the story that if I told that by itself would sound very much like kind of like uh, we were talking about earlier where it would sound like fantasy it, it's a fantasy like story it's just kept in the background and you only get to see elements of the weird or fantastic come out in the main story best analogy I know is um, Twin Peaks Twin Peaks has this huge backstory about the Black Lodge and the White Lodge and the Fireman and Bob and the One-Armed Man and uh, the Man from Another Place and the Arm and like, all these weird ideas. And they're never fully explained. At no point does he come forward and say, here's how all this works. You just get to see the effect of it in the story. And I love it. I absolutely love that kind of storytelling. So I'm trying to do that on my own. We'll see. Uh, come back to that in a moment. So let's see. Uh, you know that for you. You need the goal to make sure you don't get distracted too much. I I totally get that too. Um, you know, uh, it is that's one of the reasons I'm doing this. And this kind of answers the question about how often I stream, at least, which is often as I can. I'm trying, so I'm doing some, trying to set up some regular days, like tonight's Folklore Friday, where I start out by reading some folklore of some kind. Tomorrow I'm doing, if things go well, health permitting, I will do a uh, short story Saturday. And the idea is um, to set up a prompt and do my best to come up with a, a rough, rough is okay, but rough as I can, short story draft um, based on just a picture, a random picture and some random music put them together come up with a short story I've only done it a couple times but each time I've come up with a short story draft that I, I'm still developing like it's a it's a good enough idea that I want to carry it forward yeah yeah so like a, a, a different sort of short story prompt yep kind of uses it's like using cinematic language you find some good emotional music and uh, an evocative image and put them together at random and and you just ask yourself what's happening like what's going on in this scene and off you go <laughs> let's see uh practice equals habits habits equals more writing yep yep so um, for me, there have been two things that have been important. And one of them is the only rule I have for myself or the only rule I've had for a long time was that I have to write every day, even if it's a sentence, even if I'm super fatigued or sick and that's all I can get out. I look at the text and I do an edit or I write a sentence and it's worked for four years. I've been butt in the chair writing every day somehow. These writing sprints, though, have been the best infusion of new writing and energy for a long time. So it's been very helpful. Uh, you're a cinematic arts teacher for middle school. That's awesome. I have a story to share about that, too. And you would teach something like this to them. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know, for two things, briefly. For the longest time, I thought I wanted to go into music because of the passion associated with it. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago I realized the music was really just a feed for the story ideas. I would listen to music and the story ideas would come. And it was really the story ideas that were keeping things going. I mean, I love music still, but the stories were the main thing. I had a teacher in grade school. Um, we just called him Mr. Z. And he's, he's one of those teachers that they make movies about, you know what I mean? Absolutely devoted to his students. This was third and fourth grade. And this is third and fourth grade back in the 70s, for what it's worth. Kind of tells you how where I am age-wise. Um, and he introduced us to animation. Like in this little nowhere, out of the way school, way out in the boonies. Like we were out way kind of like up in the hills, away from the main area of town, uh, where in the area that I lived in. 
Um, one road, one store, one fire, uh, firehouse, one church, you know, this sort of place, you know, small, small town America. Most people around there live kind of up in the hills. In fact, they didn't live along the main road. But anyway, this guy in there's the setting. This guy comes in and he brings in a Super 8 camera uh, where you can do, you know, like the stop motion photography. And he has us doing things like writing, actually like drawing pictures on individual cells of film, like in the actual printed film, because that's that's what we could do. And you could see how it would work, you know, when you ran it through a projector. He had us doing uh, stop motion stuff where he'd have us all go outside and do kind of like... You know, just, just all sorts of things. It was amazing. It was the the one of the best experiences, most memorable times I can remember from school growing up, um, and probably is part of what kept all this you know kept all this going. So, uh, from what I heard, he actually went to work for Walt Disney. Uh, not really. He was one of the people. I felt I don't know. I don't really feel bad because I think he really enjoyed it. But he wrote the blurbs on like you know VHS movies and DVDs and that kind of thing like he so he wrote he did marketing writing um like I said I think that's kind of where he was going anyway he was actually a student teacher when he was at our school um super neat guy though so really really good memories uh let's see short story prompts are awesome I might like uh, January and August on Twitch. The lady writes, does a 31 days, 31 story. Oh, very cool. Let me actually, I will lose it in chat if I don't capture that. So let me grab that and actually set that aside and I will go look for that. Thank you for the tip. But yeah, I've kind of been throwing spaghetti at the wall here in terms of figuring out what works for the stream. This has been the best version of it. I, I, I'll be honest, I have expected it since it's 20 minutes of quiet followed by, which I think I can't remember if I reset my timer. That's okay. We'll, we'll chat for a little bit and then I'll get back to it. But anyway, because it's basically 20 minutes of silence with a little bit of chatting in between, I wasn't sure if it would work, but um, people have been awesome. I, I've had lots of great folks like yourself stopping by and chatting about their, their work and boy, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, the writer community also plays Game of Tomes in November. Choose a house, get a word counts written during participating streams. See who survives zombies. That's, that's, that's really cool. Boy, I've missed a lot of this. Yeah, writing streaming itself is kind of a new thing to me. Uh-oh. Oh, you see my hand going back and forth here? It's because I think my mouse just died. This was a problem I had before. And if it keeps going like it is, then what happens next is my keyboard dies. Okay, let me hand type a few things. The aforementioned too much chatting, not enough writing points. Many of us in the direction of breaks and sprints. Let's see. Oh, hey, yeah, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny, you know, that the format has worked really well so far, just if for no other reason than because 20 minutes does so far seem to be that that amount of time I can spend in um, concentrated thought. Aw, thank you very much. That's nice. But it's about as much time as I can spend focused on something without either reaching um, obsessive compulsive editing and re-editing 
or you know, anyway, the host of other potential issues. But yeah, it seems to work pretty well. So it works nice. And then it's actually nice to be able to, to kind of look up and chat with people afterwards. You know, so I had not, it's funny, I had not heard of the, even the idea of writing sprints uh, until ooh, right before the pandemic, really, I guess a little bit, a little bit further back. And there's a really good, um, not really even just a writing group, but like a collective of groups in Oregon um, called Eleven Bridges. And they have had lots and lots of really great meetups all over the place. And so, yeah, I started going to some um, writing sessions, you know, just doing writing sprints. There's actually one that I used to go to for people who wrote comics up in downtown Portland, which was a blast because you get to sit there and there are some people who are visual, you know, they're drawing, they're doing uh, visual things. There are other uh, people who are into writing comic book scripts and that kind of thing. I was thinking about trying that out for a little while. So I just wanted to kind of hang out and, and try it out. And it was great. Oh my gosh, it was awesome. It's really nice to be able to sort of borrow the energy of the folks around you to be able to, to do what you love to do. There's about five different writing groups that pop up. Wild Writers, World Anvilites, TTRPGers, Event Writers, For the Words Writers, and the YouTube Writers. Wow. It's killing me. I can't use my mouse. I, I may actually be stuck here. Uh, let me try something real quick. Let me see my last... Oh boy, it's not even doing that. Ugh, okay. I think what I'm going to have to do is um, I'd be a wild writer. Okay. I'll take that at, uh, uh, I'll take that face value. So so what is a wild writer though? Each group has a different energy they bring to Twitch. That man. I can I'll tell you. I really appreciate your mentioning all these because I've gone looking on Twitch for writers using and that you know, their their search tools leave a lot to be desired and so um it's been really tough oh someone who randomly yeah that's it that's me decides to randomly pop up on twitch yeah so much of it you know is um so i do cognitive work during the day too i'm a programmer during the day and so there's a period after doing that where i have to basically just go leave my brain alone for a little bit or it refuses to do anything. Um, let's see, ASC and uh, Envelites, TTRPGers, people who DM. Yeah, it's kind of, I kind of kind of read that from the from the names. Uh, focus on world building and use World Anvil. That's awesome. That's really cool. Let's see. Mostly, uh, I mostly know only about Steady With Me streams. Started finding reading sprints and now writing sprints. Very cool. See, I hadn't even seen reading sprints. I've been, I've been like trying to find the door into, like very broadly speaking, literary, Twitch, and YouTube. And I don't know. I'm just, my Google foo is not working very, very well lately. Event writers like OHH. O W okay pop up during camp oh yeah 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 camp in Arimo. Um, sometimes they have 100 hours of writing. Wow, you just search reading sprints and then click live on filter. Yes, yeah, I've tried that. I've done that. Same with study with me. Study with me. I've not looked for. In, in fact, um, totally makes sense. I've never thought to look for that. This is awesome. No, I've got, boy, I've got a lot of things to look into here. For the Worlds, Dust Warriors, writers who play For the Worlds, which is an RPG for writers. Write words, finish quests, get loot, progress. Cool. You're a study streamer for the Oh, that's really cool. So if, uh, if you don't mind my asking, what are you studying? Again, I did totally, it's the same sort of pattern, right? I did totally see doing that just because uh, it's the same reason that, you know, my friends and I used to hang out in, like, till dawn in all night diners, uh, studying history currently. Oh, wow. Awesome. 
I have so I have a lot of appreciation for that because it's something I have been habitually unable to do well. I don't have a good memory for things like that. And I know that that there's a view of, you know, learning history that's more about that's more relational. It's more about the events and their the connections to, you know, everything else that's going on. It's just been really difficult. Always has been. Going back to school for your history credential. Awesome. A uh, smart way to use visual code. I would have never thought of that. Yeah, I, I'm actually, you're the first person who's noticed. Um, it's basically a good text editor. It's got there's so much I can't do right now because my I'm having I.O. issues with my computer, apparently. Um, I don't know why. It's This is new. It's only the second time it's happened. But my mouse is now dead. If I try to fix it, I will also lose the keyboard. Very likely. So... Um, yeah, so I'm actually using Git for uh, saving and distributing my work as well. Like I'm using very much like a coding workflow. <laughs> and it's easy to get this into, you know, when it comes time to actually share it with someone or whatever, it's super easy to get it into Word and format it correctly and everything. Because, you know, Word is apparently the gold standard for, for all that. Twitch? Oh, man, I got it. Okay. Oh, did it move? No, it didn't move. It's open it. Twitch Fiber Network. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is so cool. Restream bot. Yeah. So the Restream bot is uh, basically just a chat aggregator. So I'm streaming out to um, Twitch and YouTube, obviously, but also Twitter and also Facebook. Um, and uh, it the their Restream bot basically aggregates the chat so that if I type something out, it goes out to all of them. It should be redistributing it, but I don't know that it is right now. <laughs> I've... It, in watching some of the, like, I go back and review my own stuff sometimes just to check for issues and whatnot, and I don't always see the chat echoing across all the different services. They have it set up so that uh, you can use it with Discord now, too, though. So, that was a person from YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so cool. So, you are seeing it. Good, good. My wife is very quietly saying goodnight to me here. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that she's still up. Uh, do, 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 do. Got the Twitch network. Praxmas is right. Just look for creative writing, writing writer tags. Awesome. I will just keep doing that. <laughs> well, I can't. I'm stuck. I can't get the timer going for another sprint. I think what I'm going to do is just. Um, I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to be done for the night. Um, I was saying earlier, I have not eaten a lot today, and didn't eat dinner. It's just, it's at probably after one in the morning now. So I'm heading out for late night um, uh, burritos or something. There's We have a halfway decent uh, place here that's 24-7, so I will, I will head out and grab something there. So, Oh, hey, yeah, thanks for the follow. I appreciate it. You do co-working on Twitch. Uh, you find some writers that way as well. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, I have to kind of dust off my... Well, I was going to say dust off, dust off my history skills, but there are none. Oh. Um, I just got another error message from Windows. Let me see if I can even write anymore. I'm going to have to do everything with cursor controls, but that's okay. That'll work. I can do that. Old school. I'm not using VI as the editor. That's, that's beyond me. Twitch is twitchy. You're always to it. 
Yeah, yeah. I know, you know, watching some, like, even some of my favorite streamers that I watch, you know, everyone gets hit by technical issues. I used to, every time there'd be some kind of technical issue, I'd, like, freeze. And, oh, my gosh, what are, you know, just go straight into panic mode. But, yeah, unfortunately, it seems to happen to everyone. You also just stalked me on Instagram and Twitter. Nice. Awesome. I'll look for you there. Yeah, my Instagram is very sad. I list it for completeness, but I need to actually get busy and start putting something on there. Well, uh, where people are comfortable and you feel like sharing, I encourage you to share Like, what's your work in progress? What kind of things you're working on? Um, I love hearing what other folks are working on. It doesn't have to be something that I normally read or enjoy. Um, I like hearing... It's it's always fun to hear people talk passionately about the things that they love. So, But yeah, do feel free to share. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just start a... Uh, Knitting Necromancers Urban Fantasy. Oh, cool. So, <laughs> I like that. I mean, I have it, you know, just based on those four words. I have, I have a picture in my head that probably needs correction, but I like it. That's, that's a fun theme. Currently reading The Count of Monte Cristo, taking a break from studying. Wow. That's one that, I'll tell you, it, it's one that I'm interested in reading, but I struggle a little bit with the classics. Um, I have been reading a lot of, like I'm currently reading Don DeLillo. Uh, I read White Noise and loved it a little while back, and now I'm reading Underworld. And Underworld is, I like it, it's definitely more of a slog than White Noise was. Um, but I'm pretty intent on, I'm about, just about 80% through it, and I'm really intent on finishing. After that, I'm, though, I'm going to go do something a little bit more light and fun. So... Petals, Pierce and Pins, Paranormal, Poly, whoop, chat is moving, Poly, Sapphic Romance, cool, Blasted Research 2, Post-Apocalyptic, Polyamorous Adventure, uh, you read it with narration from an audiobook, oh, that's, that's, I'm sure that helps too, it's a brick though, 1,065 pages, yep, yep, you know, probably another uh, four to five. You really need to just stick to three to four projects. <laughs> yeah, I've, <laughs> I've, you know, my whole life I tried doing a bunch of things all at once, and it was just a couple years back I kind of somehow like turned my brain around to where I've got one thing I'm working on in terms of writing. Uh, one work in progress. Now, like I said, I do the short story thing now and then in between. But if anything has to go, if anything has to like go by the wayside, side, it's the short stories. I've got the one thing I'm working on. Everything else is fun or optional or, ooh, I've got an idea and I blurt out something and move on, you know. Um, and even then, it's ta it's, it is taking me forever to get through this. It's going to be... I've already told myself basically that if I somehow reach the end of my days and I've never finished this, I am okay with that. So long as I actually put in the effort. So long as I give it a go, give it my best effort. If that's how it works out, I will I will consider that, you know, a life well spent. A life spent doing what it is I want to do. So it's that important. All right. Well, I'm going to go quiet for a little bit. Thanks to everyone for sharing your ideas. It's really cool. A lot of a lot of varied stuff out there. You have a document. People I blame. That's got about six different story ideas on it. Thanks to random chat words and sentences. Nice. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Best of writing to you too. All right. We'll talk to you in 20 and uh, happy writing.
Okay, there's the end of 20 minutes. I'll tell you, I've not looked at this section of the text in a long time. And, uh, a lot of stuff to fix. I'm basically kind of doing a, uh, I guess I'm skimming. Add stuff where, where I can. But again, like I said, I kind of have to write in layers. I'll go through, make changes, make changes, make changes, make changes. Make. I know that's how everyone you know, does it, but somehow it feels different. I don't know. Still, um, lots done tonight for me. <laughs> Definitely have a sense that I'm making progress that I've been lacking for a long time here. So. Not much writing, but you're finally working on some dialogue. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Happy to do it. Thank you. I there's a lot that is getting done here. That is, um, I'm drawing on the energy of the crowd here, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I like the music too. So this is um. This has been a thing for a while. It's been really difficult where naturally, uh, like a lot of streamers, I'd love to find, I'd love to be able to have a little bit more freedom to select stuff I, I personally really like or that goes along with what I'm writing. Um, you know, but they're obviously licensing issues. So I've been looking into the various services for doing this. This one is Pretzel Rocks. And... I looked into them a while back and they just didn't have enough music yet. Uh, let's see, do you want to raid another writer before I go offline? I tell you, that's a really good question. Um, I will consider it, certainly. If you have someone that you would like to offer up to raid, I've never done it. I've never actually had to, yeah, I've never really had the opportunity. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that'd be fun. Yeah, so that just that. So there is a free version of Pretzel. Um, it's a little bit limited in that they give you a very small sampling of stations. Oh, no, no, the, there's no pressure. I don't feel any pressure. I would love to try. Uh, I would, you know, it's actually kind of fun to be in the position where maybe I can do that and go hang out and say hi and go on from there. So, no, I, I welcome it, actually. Like I said, if there's someone that you know that you'd like to put their name up there, uh, be happy to happy to give it a go. Um, so, yeah, uh, this in particular on Pretzel Rocks is... Let me look at the name. It's a particular uh, label on there just called Chill Hop Music, and it's been pretty reliable. Unfortunately, some of the stations that they have are not really well-defined like the one I was using for um, raid uh, Majin Buu okay all right um, I was listening to one earlier that was supposed to be kind of like uh, I can't remember what they called it but I it makes it sound like it's going to be fairly mellow cinematic stuff and it really isn't it added I was having to skip track after track after track to find try to uh, try to find something dead have I tried Epidemic Sound? It does cost quite a bit. They've never had issues with copyright infringement. I have not yet. Um, I think I've heard of them because I was looking around at a lot of different services. Um, the one thing that I've seen that, uh, and I could be wrong about this, so correct me where I'm off here. Um, so I liked the integration that Pretzel has with uh, both Twitch and YouTube. Like, I actually kind of like the track showing up because I want to support the artists who are contributing the music. The fact that Pretzel, so that their claim is that they pay the artists who contribute the music 70% of your fee. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. That, you know, I like things that offer a good deal for the creators as well. They are just too few and far between. So many things, it ends up mostly going to the platform, right? Uh, it's pay, 
pay now. Oh, okay, you wouldn't mind paying this small amount for use of one station, but you're not paying all the money to use one station. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. Move to SoundCloud. Um, I have to look into that. I hadn't really thought about it. I, I know that there's some stuff on SoundCloud. I mean, there's stuff on SoundCloud I liked, but I thought when I went and looked, it seemed like most of it was still in, if not outright, like already licensed. It was in kind of a gray zone. Like, I actually found there's an artist that uh, wouldn't work for everything that I want to do, but really enjoyed their music. And they were part of a label that seemed to specialize in, um, what do they call that kind of licensing? There's a particular name for it. Lots and lots of musicians are trying to get into it right now. Yeah, oh yeah, I've seen the Electro Swing uh, station on there. Made a free for streaming list of his music, which is amazing. That is really cool. But see, yeah, that's, so that's one of the other, and I'm sure other people do this sort of thing too. It's not just Pretzel, but Pretzel makes it super easy. Where they have, you know, you can see the track listings going by with links and the whole thing. I know a lot of people want to turn that off. I like it. I If people hear something you like, like, yo, go click on the link, support the artist. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, so Pretzel Rocks, I'm trying out a month. Um, they make it really, really difficult to try out all the different stations, unfortunately. Lots of the other people who specialize in these kinds of services will let you sample the music pretty freely so you can get an idea of what you're going to get if you subscribe. Pretzel does not. They seem to lock it up really tight. And um, so I did one month just to try out a, like, okay, let's go check out some of the other stations. Right now, I'm inclined to think I'll probably go go with it for a little bit. I like this particular label. There have been a couple others. Uh, I figure I'll, over time, I'll try to curate a list so that I, you know, have sort of a more custom list of stuff on there to, to play during the stream. But yeah, it's been good. Yeah, I, it's funny. I saw the Electro Swing Station. I've not actually listened to it yet. Um, the, I'll tell you, the, the downsides of Pretzel is that um, their jazz selection, like I, I would love to be playing jazz for some things. I experimented with doing a typing ASMR stream. I collect typewriters. Um, and so, you know, that's another way to get some work done and do it on a stream and have people come by and all that. It's under the paywall. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, and I wanted to it, to me, I'd like to play some kind of old school jazz along with the typewriter thing. To me, that just seems like it would fit pretty well. Uh, and the jazz selection on on here is just awful. By personal opinion, I haven't found hardly anything I like. And then it's also all licensed for Twitch only, not YouTube. They license it per streaming platform. And so you've got a little switch at the top. If you want to do both Twitch and YouTube, like I do, um, it limits your selections even further. So you can see this big list of, uh, oh, there's the, there's the timer going off again. You can see a big list of potential channels, but if you turn them on for both YouTube and Twitch, it suddenly narrows it down a lot. You don't see that on the list. You don't find out that there's, you can't use it until you click play and it tells you, oh, there are no tracks here, sorry. Um, so I think there are some improvements they could make to the service itself, and they still have a long way to go to get a really robust, fully fleshed out selection of music. But I kind of hope that this is where things go. Like long term, I would love for more musicians to be able to make, if not a living, then at least be able to get some better compensation for what they do. Um, not just for streamers, but, you know, it'd be great to see, uh, a wider range of artists come up on these kinds of platforms. I think so anyway. I'm not a huge fan of the fame idea, fame culture, but you know, the, the viral only mentality, like, you know, like there's a small handful of mega artists and the rest of them are people kind of, you know, like fighting for the scraps. I, I just, that's a miserable model, both for people who make music or do other creative things and for people who want to find stuff they like. So, anyway, sermon over. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to try out that raid thing. You mean I don't like to do it for the exposure? <laughs> 
Oh, man. Yeah. It's funny, you know, between the exposure argument and then I saw a thing recently on um, Spotify and how they will use a lot of these artists in their curated lists so that the most popular lists, the ones that they push near the top of the site, contain tons of music that they're not paying licensing on. Right? So there's all sorts of things that they do to... Oh, man, it just drives me nuts. Ugh. You know, all these things coming out lately, I'm sure you've seen the different tools that they use for AI-generated images and how amazing they are and how they seem able to kind of distill the collective creative conscience of all these people down into these works of art. Side note on that, it's still derivative. It's still, by definition, all derivative. But I'd love to see that kind of system applied in a different way where, like, if it could analyze... Uh, works in such a way that it creates an abstract model that then you tell it, yeah, I like this and I like that and I like that and get a deeper sense of what people like and make a recommendation engine based on those sorts of things. Like I'm talking about it like it's easy, like you could just go out and do it. But I, I'd love to see that sort of thing done. Again, mainly for the reason that it would be really cool for to be able to connect writer to reader on a much broader scale so that it didn't you didn't have to necessarily get a massive publishing deal or whatever like if you write something that is intentionally niche like I think I am being able to find every reader you can is really important having some tools for doing that would be brilliant so this is all part of that but anyway all right uh let me see if I can actually get to twitch at this point given that I have to do everything strictly through the keyboard right now. Okay, so far so good. Where am I? There I am. <laughs> Hopping over to the system menu. All right. Thank you for stopping by. It was great to have you here. Have a good night's sleep. I hope to see you again. Um, I will I will also be going back through and I'll be looking for folks. Uh, yeah, great chatting with you, too. I'll be looking for folks, um, their own streams, their own study, you know, like like study sessions and that kind of thing. And uh, it's not even 6 p.m. for you. You'll be up for a bit. Yeah, yeah. That's the other fun thing. It's, it really has. It's been a very wide audience who's who's uh, showed up here recently. It's been fun. Okay, well, oh, come on, Twitch, you're almost there. Darn it. All right. So I'm going to try something here, and I don't think it's going to work because it's sort of indirect. Um, yeah, I could try using the share, the aggregate chat client. That is not... Oh, wait. I don't know what I'm going to do. Duh. Do, 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 do. Oh, shoot. Well, okay. It'll take a minute here. Moment of silence while I enter my really long and almost pointlessly complex password to on my phone. Just realized I'm like like it's all hidden <laughs> I'm like my phone is like right here and I'm typing in the password and all of a sudden I had this little moment of panic where I'm like wait a minute am I showing my password on this on the on the screen that would have been bad leaning back for a moment no this should like I said I'm, I'm actually kind of eager to try this out so we'll give it a go
about that, but I have to have a purpose to be recalled and come across the same purpose. Okay, finally a chat. All right, let's see. I'm just going to go look for the username that you mentioned. Would you mind typing it again? I really apologize, but I'm literally just stranded without my mouse here. If I can't do it by typing directly into a preset text box or through one of the very limited things I have my stream deck set up to do, I'm, I'm kind of... I am... Uh, stuck at the moment. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by tonight. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and like I said, this gives me a lot of energy to get really good work done. I hope it helps you, too. Happy writing. Uh, I will be trying to do my uh, Short Story Saturday stream hopefully earlier in the day tomorrow. This would be around, say, 10 to 11 in the morning Pacific time. But I can't, no guarantees. Like I said, it depends on a lot of other factors. As soon as I can, give it a try. So take care, and I will see you again soon.